All right, uh, let's prepare our recordings. The PC recording is underway. According to the cloud, all set. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council preliminary budget hearing of the Committee on Criminal Justice. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today, and thank you for your patience as we get started. Uh, welcome to the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget he oversight hearing for the Criminal Justice Committee of the New York City Council. I'm City Council Member Keith Powers, Chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. And before I go forward, I want to just note a few members uh, of the Council who are with us today. Uh, Council Member Dharma Diaz, Council Member Alika Amprey Samuel, Council Member Bob Holden. Uh, I believe we were joined by Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and we'll be joined by more momentarily. Um, today, we are going to be hearing from the Department of Correction, the Department of Probation, the Board of Correction, and members of the public. I want to thank everyone for being here and joining us today. And we obviously we've also been joined by Council Member Rivera as well. Um, we are going to be uh, first hearing from the Department of Correction today. The department's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget totals $1.16 billion and has increased by $7 million since adoption last year. The preliminary budget that we're hearing today introduces no new needs and uh, re re reflects a savings of $48.8 million in fiscal year 2022. With a budgeted uniform headcount of 7,060 individuals and, a un and an actual uniform headcount that exceeds that budgeted headcount, the officer the person in custody ratio is continues to be high and is unusually high compared to other jurisdictions in the United States. We'll certainly have questions for the department about their spending and the headcount. But more urgently, we have seen a number of disturbing revelations in the last few weeks that suggest a troubling pattern at the Department of Corrections that deserve attention here today. In recent weeks, two individuals charged with murder and attempt, attempted murder were mistakenly released. We'll certainly have questions about that. Separately, two individuals died within a week of each other at Rikers Island. And of course, we will have questions about that. And this weekend, the Daily News reported that over 1,500 privileged phone calls were illegally recorded inside city jails due to a clerical error by Securus Technologies, the contractor who handles telephone service for the DOC facilities. And we have lots of questions about that. We now know because of the reporting that this problem was widespread, affecting cases in all five boroughs and dates what we believe back to last year. In Rothschild recording more than 1,500 phone calls, the department has broken trust with New Yorkers and raises a huge question of credibility in my eyes, and I think in many of my colleagues' eyes, about the contractor and the agency. Today, we're demanding answers, very clear answers, on how those incidents occurred and how DOC and the contractor plan to respond. These revelations, all the ones I noted, highlight systemic problems and come on the heels of a number of other stories out of DOC since the department last came before, I, I, or since we last had a hearing. And I will note that actually last year's hearing of the budget actually got canceled right in the midst of COVID, which of course was the right decision for everybody's safe and safety and health. But we have lots of questions about what's happened in the last year. We are gonna be here demanding clear answers to know how these incidents occurred and how they plan to respond. Um, in recent months, we've also learned correction officers are being forced to serve 24 hour triple shifts. Despite the existing headcount, we've learned that more individuals died of COVID-19 contracted in city jails than we believe were initially reported. We've heard complaints of overcrowding in our city jails as units have uh, been overcrowded over 50% capacity. And we continue to see long-term long troubling tens continue to develop, 
most notably the rising violence that puts everyone in our city jails at risk. Despite a decrease in the jail population, the rates of violence amongst people in custody has increased 155% since fiscal year 2014, and rates of serious injury by individuals in custody have increased by 500% in that same time period. And assaults on staff have increased by 250% in that, 215% in that time. So we're here to talk today, talk about the budget here of the Department of Correction and the other agencies, but as we bring the Department of Correction forward, I think we have a responsibility and a right to ask why we see continue to see a troubling pattern of mismanagement, why the conditions in jail seem to be getting worse, and what does this preliminary budget do to help address all these issues? And I will end with this before handing it over. So the Department of Corrections, all eyes are on you right now. We expect clear answers and accountability today and moving forward. And individuals that have their privacy rights taken away from them deserve the confidence to know the steps that are being taken immediately and moving forward to safeguard it against ever happening again. We'll be joined by a number of individuals from the Department of Corrections who will be introduced and sworn in momentarily. And then we will begin your testimony when you are ready. I'll call forward the Department of Corrections to be sworn in and testify. Thank you. Thank you. I am Agatha Mavropoulos, counsel to the City Council's Committee on Criminal Justice. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. When it is your turn to testify, you will receive a prompt to unmute. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. We will first hear testimony from the Department of Correction followed by a period of question and answer from the committee members. Next, we will hear testimony from the Department of Probation followed by a period of question and answer. And then we will hear testimony from the Board of Correction followed by a period of question and answer. Afterwards, we will hear testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. Committee members will be limited to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the oath to members of the Department of Correction. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Linnell McGinley Liddy. I do. Brenda Cook. I do. Hazel Jennings. I do. Patricia Lyons. I do. Heidi Grossman. I do. Dana Wax. I do. Judy Beal. I do. Francis Torres. I do. And Kenneth Stukes. I do. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from First Deputy Commissioner Linnell McGinley Liddy. You may begin when ready. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I'm First Deputy Commissioner Linnell McGinley Liddy, and I'm glad to see that you're all healthy and well. I'm pleased to be joined today by the dedicated members of the Department of Corrections leadership team, including Chief of Department Hazel Jennings, Chief of Staff Brenda Cook, Bureau Chief of Security Kenneth Stukes, Deputy Commissioner for Financial Facility and Fleet Administration, Patricia Lyons, Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Heidi Grossman, Deputy Commissioner for Programs and Community Partnerships, Judy Beal, Assistant Commissioner for Programs and Community Partnerships, Francis Torres, and Deputy Chief of Staff, Dana Wax. Today, my colleagues and I are here to discuss the fiscal year 2022 budget the impact of coronavirus on our facilities and the department's response to this unprecedented event and our dedication to continued reform efforts. First and foremost, I want to respond to some very troubling matters that have made recent news. With respect to the concerns regarding Securus, who is our third party telephone vendor and the recording of privileged conversations of people in custody with their counsel and legal representatives. I want to assure the council and the public that we take this issue extremely seriously. Although this was a human data entry error on the part of Securus, confidential attorney-client communication is a fundamental right. 
and we have a duty to ensure privileged conversations are private. Since becoming aware of this issue in December of last year, we have been taking aggressive steps to identify the scope of the problem and create a robust quality assurance system with the vendor. This includes establishing an online database so attorneys can confirm their number is properly privatized, requiring audits to understand the scope of the problem, the sequestering of any calls that should not have been reported so they can no longer be accessed, and adding a regular manual check to be, form, be performed by an additional Securus employee of 20% of the numbers of each do not record list set by the department to ensure data entries being done properly. As an extra layer of protection, the department is also designing its own audit process to guard against future errors. Finally, all calls that are not on the do not record list have and will continue to have a pre-recorded announcement play when the call begins that makes clear to all parties that the call is being recorded, allowing either side to terminate the call prior to discussing any privileged information. The pre-recorded announcement has been enhanced to specifically warn attorneys that if they are hearing the announcement, the call is not private and they should hang up. This matter has this matter has further been referred to DOI so that they can conduct an independent investigation into it. The department plans to cooperate fully with DOI. As much as we believe these steps will provide appropriate mitigation against further issues, we recognize that this should have never happened and are taking all steps to guard against any further issues in the future. We have similarly taken swift action in response to the circumstances surrounding the erroneous discharge of a dangerous individual from our custody. This was a significant error that should not have happened. And we immediately suspended four staff members related to this event. We are continuing to collaborate with law enforcement in order to apprehend this individual. COVID-19 continues to weigh heavily on this city. Throughout the crisis, the department has worked to be as transparent and forthcoming as possible. Although we openly report on the deaths of individuals who passed away in custody, we did not have a process to report on the deaths of those compassionately released from custody as a result of illness who later died outside of our care. We are working with our partners at Correctional Health Services to provide a more complete picture of these deaths while respecting the rights of the formerly detained individual and those of their family. Before proceeding further with my testimony, I also want to express my condolences to the families of the two men who had been in custody who recently passed away. Every death in custody is tragic. These made even more so after a year of so much loss. The department conducts investigations following any death in custody. However, following these deaths, we also plan to fully comply with an independent audit of our mental observation units conducted by the Board of Correction to evaluate and make recommendations surrounding our practices in these housing areas. We anticipate this work will support the department and correctional health services in our efforts to care for the most vulnerable individuals. I'd also like to take the opportunity today to provide you with an update on our ongoing COVID-19 mitigation efforts. Speak to ongoing reform work underway and advise you of our budgetary plans for the upcoming year. Last March, we were drafting action and safety plans based on a globally limited understanding of COVID-19. We relied on our crisis management skills and our profound duty to protect our staff and those in our custody. In a matter of hours, we sprung into action, assembling protocols for distancing and sanitation, securing PPE, learning about testing, and building relationships with our healthcare partners across the city. This critical and expeditious work embodies the department's refined mission statement, proving that we're an organization that goes beyond care, custody, and control and is one that focuses on creating safe and supportive environments for those in custody. 
Before I continue any further, I'd like to recognize the dedicated and hardworking employees of the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services for their incredible efforts and sacrifices throughout this pandemic. Tragically, the department lost 11 members of our staff to COVID-19 and over 1,900 uniform and non-uniform staff members have tested positive over the past year. Despite these uncertain and challenging times, DO staff, DOC staff have remained committed to ensuring the safety and well-being of those entrusted to our care every single day. At a great expense to themselves and their families, I'm proud of their heroic efforts and I'm honored to work beside them. Now with approximately 60 patients with active cases in our facilities, the department continues to successfully mitigate COVID-19 within its jails and emerged as a national leader in responding to the crisis. Our success in managing COVID-19 is a result of establishing a mitigation protocol, providing regular and clear communication to staff and people in custody and modifying services to support our population. In partnership with Correctional Health Services, the department identified entry point vulnerabilities, which allowed the virus into our facilities. We developed a responsive tiered housing strategy that separated those with COVID-19 exposure and positivity from the general population. Additionally, the department established a robust sanitation protocol provided and mandated PPE for all staff and persons in custody and painted cues in common areas to encourage social distancing. These measures have been in place since the height of the pandemic and have continued to keep people in custody safe as evidenced by the department's consistently low COVID-19 positivity rate, a figure which is lower than current citywide statistics. The department has continued to build on its existing mitigation strategy and now offers on-site testing and vaccination opportunities for our staff and partners with CHS to afford the vaccine to all eligible persons in custody. This year, the majority of our ingenuity and creativity was devoted to reimagining well-established services in a COVID-19 safe manner. We developed hotlines that connected people in custody to chaplains discharge planning, and LGBTQ services. Additionally, we stood up a televisit initiative in a matter of weeks, created a mechanism for supervised community release, and rolled out thousands of tablets with educational and recreational programming across our facilities. We're in discussions with our health partners to determine when it is safe to resume in-person visitation and other in-person services. Still, despite the immediate challenges before us, the department continued to prioritize our reform efforts and made progress on initiatives that will shape correctional best practices for years to come. As you are aware, Commissioner Brand participated in the mayor's working group to eliminate the use of solitary confinement and a draft of the board's revised rules surrounding restrictive housing based on the recommendations of that working group was recently made public. The department has been a leader in punitive segregation reform for the past six years and looks forward to continuing to set the standard for other jurisdictions to follow. Further, we are continuing to work closely with sister agencies to push forward the borough-based jail initiative and are actively working with partners to design state-of-the-art jail facilities informed by lessons learned through COVID-19. The department's fiscal year 2022 expense budget is 1.16 billion. The vast majority of this, 87%, is allocated for personal services and 13% for other than personal services. The fiscal year 2022 budget is 16.8 million more than this year's budget of 1.14 billion. This increase is due to the addition of collective bargaining funding. Included in the preliminary budget are decreases of 9.6 million in fiscal year 2021 
61.6 million in fiscal year 2022 and 23.9 million in each fiscal year 2023, 2024, and 2025. The following are some highlights of the major initiatives that were included in the budget. Hiring and attrition management, a reduction of 1.2 million and 64 non-uniform positions in fiscal year 2021 related to delays in filling vacant positions. Uniform overtime, a reduction of 48.8 million in fiscal year 2022 and 25 million beginning in fiscal year 2023. COBA deferral, an 8.9 million in retroactive collective bargaining payouts was deferred from fiscal year 2021 to fiscal year 2022. And in conclusion, I just wanna thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and for your continued support of the work we do on behalf of those in our care. My colleagues and I are available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the testimony. I want to go back to the topic I mentioned in my testimony and you referred to, which is about the report on the phone call. So this weekend, as you know, the Daily News reported that a audit revealed a widespread problem with privileged phone calls in city jails being wrongfully recorded, which I believe is an egregious violation of the rights of incarcerated people. On February 17th, as you know, I sent a letter with the city council speaker to the department requesting information and raising this concern on potentially illegal illegally recorded phone calls in our city jails. Can you tell us when you, as the Department of Correction, first became aware of the wrongfully recorded phone calls? Chair Powers, thank you for your question. Without a doubt, this was a serious and troubling mistake and something that I, as an attorney, take very seriously because I understand the implications here. It impacts those entrusted to our care and it impacts the public trust in us. We have a responsibility to help make it right. Once the department became aware of the possibility that certain attorneys' numbers were erroneously placed on a list that resulted in their calls being recorded, we acted immediately. We demanded that our third-party vendor securists investigate the scope of this serious error and have notified defender groups and district attorneys' offices so that they can take appropriate steps with respect to these calls. We made it clear to our vendor secure that this must be addressed immediately. And they put several additionally quality control measures into place. We are working with them to ensure these measures are up to our standard. I will ask Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Heidi Grossman, to provide additional information on the scope and the remediation measures being put into place. Before we go into scope and remediation, I just wanna go back to my question which was when did the Department of Correction first become aware of the wrongfully recorded phone calls? We'll remediation after that. Thank you, Chair Powers. Um, we learned in um, December of 2020 from the Bronx District Defenders that there were about four uh, calls that was of concern. And that prompted, and they learned that this was of concern because there were privileged communications disclosed to the Bronx defenders from the district attorney's offices in response to pretrial discovery. So upon learning about this by the Bronx defenders, we immediately contacted Securus to investigate and identify if in fact, uh, what, what the root cause of that, that, that serious error was. Securus immediately upon learning about this issue, immediately um, identified the, the problem. They, ident they placed those telephone calls on a do not record list and they worked towards sequestering any calls that were inadvertently disclosed. So the, what occurred thereafter is that Securus then was asked to do an audit to continue with the scope and find out how far reaching this was. And we, because we wanted to see if this was a systemic issue or if this was inadvertent issues with four um, calls. Let me just say from the get go, one is one too many. We recognize that. I share uh, First Deputy Commissioner um, her view about how important and sacrosanct 
the attorney client privilege is. We take it very seriously. It's a great concern. And that's why we, we moved very quickly. What also occurred was in February, we learned from, so at the time that we learned from uh, Securus about the Bronx uh, defenders, we understood that there were about 18 telephone numbers at issue. There were about 29 unique people who that impacted, and there were about 118 calls at issue. So we, we engaged with the Bronx defenders, let them know as we were learning information. Not all of those calls were turned over to the, Bronx, the, the district attorney's offices. That's, that is something that we've been working with to try to identify and share with the various district attorney's offices so that they can identify those calls. Let me say then that by February, we received another notice from the Brooklyn defenders with a similar complaint. And we immediately contacted Securus again to look into what occurred with Brooklyn. And we then asked that they conduct a wholesale audit and look at all the defender organizations to identify um, any, any issues with any numbers. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we learned in terms of what the root cause was. What we learned, as was stated, was that there was a human data input error. And we learned that this has to do with a drop-down menu issue where the wrong option on a drop-down menu was used. We have instructed Securus that any time we provide a list of numbers that should be placed on a do not record list, that, we, that they provide and set the privacy setting to the maximum privacy allowed. And that means no recording and no monitoring. However, Securus, who services other jails and prisons throughout the country, they have other options and needs from other prisons and jails. And there is an additional privacy setting that they offer others that is a site-specific privacy setting. And that means that it's the, the privacy setting is specific to just one facility. So what we learned is that an individual erroneously set the privacy setting by looking at a drop-down men menu uh, for the numbers that the Department of Corrections supplied to Securus. They errone an individual erroneously set the privacy to the wrong privacy setting. So Securus immediately um, identified and did an analysis as we understand it. And they removed one, one of the individuals from working on this issue, uh, from in, in working towards uh, placing numbers on privacy settings. And they, that person is no longer, as I understand it, working or assigned to work on these matters. But what Securus did do is they immediately retrained their team of people who are supposed to input the data into the database. And they also implemented a quality control process. And the quality control process includes a um, when an individual inputs the numbers into the database, it also includes a separate individual coming um, after the information is input, having a separate independent person from Securus uh, do a manual review of about 20% of the numbers to ensure that the privacy settings were set properly. That information is then shared with the department to confirm. And as the first deputy commissioner also mentioned, what we are doing and what, what we've directed Securus to do is to establish a, an online database so that the telephone numbers of all 276,000 numbers that are placed on do not record, that that database be made available online for attorneys to input that number to make sure that their number is set to the proper do not record setting. In addition, what you should know is that every time a, a person makes a phone call and any time and a recipient of the phone call receives the phone call, there are these warnings and admonishments that are played that tells the caller that the call is subject to monitoring and recording. 
And it also tells the recipient of the call that it's subject to monitoring and re reporting. What we have since done, since we've learned about this issue, is we have also enhanced one of the admonishments to include a direction to an attorney that if they are hearing this admonishment and they are an attorney, that they should know this call is not private, you should hang up, contact the department, and register this number with the do not record list. Can I, can I just stop, can I do, can I just stop you there? Cause I wanna, I wanna go through that. Um, first of all, I just gotta say, I mean, to find out that individuals privacy was violated based on an individual not knowing how to operate a drop down menu on software provided to you by your third party contractor, to me raises major questions about whether that person, that group should continue to operate within our jails. We'll talk about the audit measures and things like that. But I wanna go just a couple things. First is, can you just tell us what the first wrongfully recorded date of the first wrongfully recorded phone call was? The, the, the period of time that we're, that was in, looked into it goes from March, 2020 to February, 2021. And do we know why that's the date range? Yes. Um, so um, what we, uh, what, when through the years that we have been um, working with Securus, uh, there are times that uh, there will be outreach from the various defender organizations to say that we have learned from uh, the district attorney or we have reason to believe that a number um, has not been properly set to the do not report. So there are one-off um, outreach to us um, through the years and off, there are times where the telephone number, a personal telephone number, um, was called of an attorney, never made it to the do not record list. And we would work with our partners, with the defender organizations to remedy and immediately and try to work out getting these numbers registered. So what happened is in March, 2020, when the city went on pause and all the courts closed and it was difficult um, for the defender organizations and many of us to get to work. Many people didn't have telephone numbers that they could use from their offices. So they would use their personal phone numbers to make phone calls. And so what happened was we would get numerous, um, we would work out with the defender organizations how to resolve those issues and how to work with them to in, in, in include their numbers on the do not record list. And so the reason why we went back to March of 2020 is because that was the year that we, were, we weren't sure if this was relevant to an issue related to going on pause or something else. Um, also, we, uh, I believe our recordings are only held for about 18 months. So we thought that the eight, that one year period was a, a reasonable date to address and capture um, any calls that have to be placed on a do not record list um, and sequestered. So do you have a guarantee that any of the calls prior to March 2020 were not really wrongfully recorded? No, we don't have it. We don't have a guarantee because um, I'm not sure. We don't. We don't have a guarantee that calls were not properly recorded. What we do know is that the district attorney's offices have been notified of all the telephone numbers, so they um, have the name of the individual who is is a defendant. They have the telephone number um, of the attorneys um, who were called, so they will be able to look back. And we, we are also working with them to identify those cases that um, where uh, information was provided pursuant to a subpoena, because I will say that not every phone call that was recorded was actually produced to the district attorney's office. Some people may not have even accessed, um, some of those numbers and calls may not have been accessed, they just may have been recorded. And so this is- No, I, I understand I understand that, but I'm guessing what I'm mean, trying to find out is, you're doing an audit, you've done an audit, and you've gone back to March 2020, and you've tried to, you've explained, tried to explain to us why that is. But what I'm not hearing is any sort of guarantee in the past, or any confidence, I maybe suppose, that prior to March 2020, that numbers for that are of, def of, def of defenders, or, or those conversations rather, have not been recorded or transmitted 
to district attorneys. Is that- Well, I would say this. I would say this. There are discovery laws that are in place that require the district attorneys to produce the recorded messages to the defender organizations. And so that is how we learned most recently in December about the recent calls. And that is how we learned in February from the Brooklyn defenders about their calls. So um, I would I would expect and um, believe that if there were inadvertent disclosures, that those calls would have been produced um, because it's a very tight discovery schedule. So if the defender organizations um, learned about recordings that should have been turned over, we did not learn about that. They have not identified that. So I said I would submit that right now we have the telephone numbers at issue. And the then we are doing the audit to identify what has been turned over. And so the key is going to be to, to have the DA identify what cases are related to whatever criminal case so that they can do their due diligence. But from the department standpoint, we absolutely understand and appreciate the, the, um, we, the importance of placing numbers pri properly on a privacy setting, not recording and not monitoring. And we've been informed by Securus and we that, that all the calls that were at issue, that all the phone numbers that's supposed to be on the do not record list, they have been properly placed on the do not record list. And I will tell you with the addition of this enhanced recording, we will, um, we have started to hear from different organizations that they are starting to hear those messages um, and that, that uh, and, and they understand. And so the warnings are there. And I will also say that every call that, that was made, if it's not set to the proper privacy setting, you are, a person is going to hear the warning. Um, it, it doesn't mitigate um, 100% the fact that we have to do better and do what's necessary to make sure this doesn't happen again. But there, the, when we put all these systems in place, we believe moving forward, we have um, systems in place to ensure that, that confidential communications will be respected and that they will remain confidential. Uh, so let me raise two issues with you on, on the recordings. Two things. One is I have heard from organizations that they in the past, even including this past calendar year, have inquired to the DOC about those recordings and noticing them and have asked and been told um, uh, inconsistent information about whether they are actually being recorded or not in light of those recordings. Second, when I believe earlier in COVID last year, we raised an issue to you about medical calls that, that were, we were told by folks were being also, that message was, was appearing uh, on those calls and we're told by them that those calls were by told by the agency rather that those age calls are not being recorded. So here's my concern. We don't have any guarantee or any evidence that prior to March 2020, that individuals weren't having them. We have a guess, we have a hope, we have some belief perhaps based on discovery that these calls were not uh, being recorded. But we also have the agency potentially giving us incorrect or misleading or, or at the minimum inconsistent information about those recordings. If folks come to you and ask, what is this, what is happening with a recording on this call and are told not to worry about it? Yes, suppose they should be cynics and continue to uh, uh, not, you know, perhaps hang up the phone up, but, you know, given information and uh, ourselves included about the status of those recordings, I think there is a question about whether individuals believe they were being not still not being recorded in spite of that record uh, in, in, in spite of that message. Uh, so I, 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 um, I would um, I would say that our we believe and we stand by the fact that our uh, we are not misleading um, anyone that we we do not um, that is not what we're here to do is to mislead. We've been completely transparent. We've been completely open about it. And it, our goal is to remediate this issue and make sure that confidential attorney-client communications are protected. The, uh, the belts and suspenders are these outgoing recorded messages. And, um, and I believe that most attorneys know that if you're hearing the, um, the message, then, then they, they understand because there are 270,000 attorneys on the do not record list. We have gotten, we are talking about 
at, at this point about 120 telephone numbers. That tells us that many of the defender organizations making, and there are 9 million calls in 2020. That's telling me and telling the department that there are many, many people understand that if you hear these recordings, that that's a flag that there is an issue that you need to telephone the department about and that you should not be proceeding with the call. It's but, I'm, but I'm raising an issue to you that they have. And that in the cases where they have, they received inconsistent information. And in instances where we have raised this issue, we have received different information. So the idea that the recording is the fail safe here against any sort of uh, potential uh, uh, wrongdoing is really not the answer. I, I, I mean, I understand your point, which is that here the recording hang up, but if they come to you and ask, what is the, what is the guidance on here? I, I, and they get guidance and continue to do as, gui as, 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 as recommended, I don't think they can be faulted for that. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm, so, I'm not, we're not faulting, um, we're not faulting anyone. We take, we believe that, um, that these um, recording, these recordings um, flag an issue. I will say with the question about, and your, your issue and your, and your statement about inconsistencies, there are many times that we will receive a call from a defender organization where they will say that uh, a call um, should have been put to the do not report uh, do not record list, and they didn't realize that their cell, their personal cell phone number was not properly registered, or some other number. And we've kind of gotten to um, identify the issue and rectify it. And so um, it's very hard for me to just um, address um, these general um, statements about inconsistent statements, and we're providing inconsistent um, information. When we hear information, we ask for the details, the date of the call who called, and that gives us the ability to uh, dig in and identify the direct issue and how to, how to solve it. Chair, Chair Powers, if there is a specific um, number or person you're referring to, I would direct them to reach out directly to um, General Counsel Heidi Grossman, and we will look into that. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is directly from a hearing we had where I asked this question. This is the question that was asked. Individuals are being told that the call is being recorded. Uh, this is about medical calls. And I asked directly, are those calls re recorded by being, are those calls recorded by either the Department of Corrections, Correctional Health Services, or any, uh, any other agency or entity? This is from a hearing last year. And the answer was no. Uh, I think I think it looks like they're from the, this is from the city council transcript. There's three no's in here. And, uh, and we will send this to you, but I, I believe you guys are on the record as an agency telling us that medical calls were not being recorded despite that warning. So I will we'll, we'll follow up with you on that, but I, I, I wanna be very careful to discuss the recording in light of that and things we have heard from individuals. So I wanna ask you to keep, to keep going. So, and we will follow up with you on that as well. The, um, you became aware of this in December of last year. Why didn't you audit all five boroughs immediately? Why did uh, well, when we, well, first of all, what we learned was that it was about four, it was, it was literally four, um, I'm sorry, it was about four numbers um, that we were um, initially told about uh, from the Bronx Defender Organization. So um, like the years past where we get, um, we didn't know if the, what, what the scope of the issue, whether this was a systemic issue or if it was a one-off, but immediately upon learning from the Brooklyn defenders that this was an issue. Uh, we immediately directed a, a, an audit of all the defender organizations. That doesn't mean that we didn't move forward with remedial steps, quality assurance um, development, and all the other remediation that we thought we needed to um, direct and require in response to even these particular um, calls. Um. But why would not why not immediately just go audit all five boroughs? I mean, why would you believe it's it's alone? I mean, as we've noted already, why would you believe this is uh, 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 only in one borough based on this? Or uh, you know, to me, it would feel obvious to go and check other areas to audit and see where where this issue might occur as well. If you have human error occurring at you within your right. contractor, why not? Well, 
No, I guess I guess from from our perspective, when you have two hundred and seventy six thousand numbers in a do not record list, and you're seeing four numbers, and it doesn't, um, and we we didn't, um, we're, we needed to first identify is this what kind of how how wide scale this was. It did not appear to be a wide scale issue at that time. And upon learning and receiving more information and um, receiving additional information, we immediately asked Securus to do an audit of all the defender organizations. And that, that that's what we did. Do you have confidence that this isn't happening with medical calls? Um, I'm not, I, I would have to look into more about the medical calls because uh, I, I'm, I'm here addressing this specific issue with the attorney-client communications uh, and um, all the information that we came prepared to discuss with respect to uh, those that are subject to subpoenas. Um, we're, we were able to do a deep dive of that, but we're happy to get back to you, Chair Powers. Because um, I, I, am, I am concerned that we raised this issue last year. I can send you the transcript. Of I asked this question to you about medical calls and individuals getting re potential recorded messages. And the agency had said, uh, I believe it says they're whitelisted. So those numbers are not, those numbers are preset. They're not recorded by the system is the response that we received. I can't give you the individual because it's unidentified here from DOC. I would ask you, the agency has to go back and look at medical calls as a separate category here and to determine whether this is happening there as well. And I, I you know, am concerned that we will see more, you know, more of this based on that information we have heard and, um, and now the answer we've given on the record. So um, can I just, so I, I, can you please, can you guys look at medical calls as well? Yes. Yes, we yes. will. Um, can you talk to us about your role in this in this process, the DOC's role? You are the receiver of the phone numbers from the, 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 the individuals that are supposed to go on that list and then transmit those over to Securus, is that correct? That's correct. We, the defender organizations will um, e email us when they would like to have uh, certain telephone numbers um, added to a do not record list. And we, we can get emails, we can get lists, and then what we do is we share that information, the lists, with Securus and, and um, direct that, they, uh, that the numbers um, be placed on the proper privacy setting and that they be placed on a do not report list. Okay. I want to know we've also been joined by um, Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer as well. I apologize for missing him there. Uh, welcome, Council Member. Um, I hope you're feeling better. Um, you have done an audit to date. Oh, so, so one, 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 one follow-up question to that. Have, have, do you have confidence that every number you're receiving by the agency is getting handed over to Securus? Um, well, we have a process in place that provides for that. And, uh, so when someone sends us an email we send it and, and if there, if there is some issue with communication, we will will be communicating with, and people understand that they have to wait until they they um, get confirmation. People just, I don't think you're just assuming that the call is going to be added, but we-, we Do, do uh, you receive a confirmation if you are an attorney and you send uh, it to corrections? Yes. And do you receive a confirmation from Securus when they receive your list or edit additions? Yeah. We do, we do get confirmation. Okay. I heard it. I, okay. Um, the audit that you conducted, as I understand it, has so far has only covered the Bronx and Brooklyn. And as I understand, it's because those district attorneys have produced phone calls that um, uh, were not supposed to be recorded. Uh, the Daily News report, these recordings were also provided um, to DA's offices in Manhattan, Staten Island, and Queens. Have you conducted audits of those three boroughs to check on whether phone number, what, what, have you conducted an audit of those three boroughs? The audit, the Securus conducted an audit of all the numbers um, that were at issue um, from the Brooklyn Defenders and the Bronx Defenders, and they um, have also been directed to do the same for the other defender organizations. We just don't, you know, those results have to be 
um, we, we need to finalize those results and, um, and when we're ready to share that information directly with the defender organizations, we will do that. So that when do you when do you believe that audit will those audits will be completed? We expect that to be done very shortly, and that we'll be able to um, we will be able to communicate um, that with the, the remaining defender organizations shortly. And if you're a public defender or a client, for that matter, that might be impacted by this and haven't been audited yet. What 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 is your advice to them right now? Well, um, I I'm not in a position to give advice. But well, I guess I guess my question is. How do they know? That's lawyer's job to do the advice, but let me just say what I would, what, what we have in place is uh, we have notified the district attorney's offices um, of the numbers and we've, we've given the same information to the DAs as we have to the Bronx and Brooklyn defenders so that they have as many, many details as possible with the calls, the name of the defender at issue, who is involved in representing the individual defendant client. And um, and I and I believe the district attorney's offices that I've spoken, the representatives in the district attorney's office, take this very seriously. Um, many of them have their um, processes in place already um, on on how to handle um, attorney client um, inadvertently produced attorney client communications. Uh, so I I believe that the, what we did was we provided the same information to all stakeholders so that they could have their own conversations to make sure the they mitigate any impact um, on, um, and, and also to identify if in fact calls were um, turned over to them. Because again, even though the calls were recorded, it doesn't necessarily mean they were turned over to the district attorney's offices. How many calls of the, how many of these calls were given to the DA's offices? That we don't know. We're, 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 um, we're going through that and uh, that's, that's, we're not 100% sure of that. But we have been um, working through our data to try to, be, to share as much information as we come upon that information with the district attorneys so that we can direct them. But besides that, the, the key thing that we did, with the key thing is that we provided the telephone number at issue, the name of the, the defendant. So it that then allows the district attorney, in our view, to um, um, identify if they are a defendant, if they've received recorded, um, recordings, and they can instruct the line ADA to um, um, sequester any calls uh, and make sure that no one is listening to those calls. So I just want to add also, um, Chair Powers, um, pending the um, database that we plan to post so attorneys can search to determine if they're calls are on that do not record list. They can also, if any attorney has any question, they can reach out to the legal division um, and we will follow up with Securus and confirm that the number is on the do not record list. When is the database gonna be complete or, or up and running? We, we've directed um, Securus to act um, as quickly as possible. And we believe that it should be, um, that they're working very quickly and we, we hope it's going to be up very soon. Um, I can't say specifically what date because I have no control over Securus, but they have um, they have definitely um, committed to doing this. What is the are, were there any calls that were provided to Day's offices that were used in trials since time this since the time this mistake was made? Was there any what calls? Were there any call, any of the calls that were provided to the district attorneys used in trials since the time that this mistake was made? I, I wouldn't have that information. I don't know that to be the case. Um, and do any and um, what is the process for providing recorded calls to the district attorneys? Are they required to formally subpoena material? Or are they able to use materials in other ways? Through a subpoena process. Okay. And do any other city or federal entities have access to recorded calls through any access other than a subpoena? I'm sorry. No, no subpoena only. And no other. Okay. Um, what is the status of the contract with Securus? The status of the contract is that it, um, the contract ends in the, at the end of the month and it is um, needs to be renewed. And what is the status of the agency's consideration of the contract in light of recent events? Um, well, what, what, what's possible for us as we're considering the renewal of the contract is that we can renew the contract uh, we have a 12-month option, but what we um, what we can do is renew the contract for nine months, 
rather than a year. And if the contract is renewed for nine months rather than a year, the value of the contract is reduced significantly by $750,000. Um, what is also possible is that we could issue a new competitive procurement. Uh, at this point in time, um, Chair Powers, we cannot terminate the contract with Securus because that would disrupt all the free phone calls that are by people in custody. Uh, and that we have an obligation to uh, provide a moral and legal obligation to provide access to the phone so that people in custody can call their loved ones. Um, the, um, I take a break there. I, I may want to, I want to come back to a number of other issues, but I, I see I have some colleagues, at least like one colleague here wants to ask questions. So I'm going to move to him uh, in a second. I just want to see if additional questions on on this issue. Um, what, what, will you commit to providing the findings to the city council of your additional audits? Yes. And sorry, I will just to go back. When is the expected time frame when you will have those? We're, we would like to see these audits done immediately. So we're, we're, we have to circle back and just make sure everything is, is um, fully um, vetted and that we have um, complete and accurate final audits. And that should be shortly. Uh, we do can get back to that, the exact time, but we, we will we'll respond shortly. Do you have confidence in the third party group here that provided such a basic error that was such a major violation of people's rights? It was a data, it was a data entry. Essentially, do you have confidence in them to continue to work here in New York City based on that? I believe that we've set up that we have set up um, adequate and robust quality assurance provisions to protect the privacy of confidential communications. Mm -hmm. I believe that Securus has taken ownership. They've taken accountability. They've been cooperative. They have owned, they have taken responsibility and they have um, done um, all that we have asked in terms of audits, uh, establishing this online database, quality controls, retraining of their staff, among other things that we've discussed already. So we believe that we are in a position to protect um, the, the rights, the, the confidential communications. And in addition, having that, that belt and suspenders um, announcement during a phone call, everyone should know moving forward that if an attorney is hearing that recorded message or anyone's hearing that recorded message, it means that the call is not confidential and they should end the call and immediately contact the legal division. More importantly, I, I would just like to add that the individual who is identified as um, um, actually um, committing this error, this person is no longer assigned to DOC matters and working on anything related to DOC. Yeah, I hope not. I hope they should, they should, I'm not sure that person should be employed at that at Securus at this point in time. I mean, beyond uh, working alongside the New York City Department of Corrections. Um, are, are you aware, is the department aware of any other issues with this contractor about illegally recording privileged communications in the past? I'm not aware of, um, of with New York City. I'm not aware of any- No, anywhere, anywhere, outside of New York City, in New York City, other states. We are not aware. Okay, it, it, you know, uh, folks have raised to us issues that have been come up around California, Maine, Kansas, and Texas when it comes to illegally recording privileged communications by this contractor, and I believe they've been sued in those states for that. Um, you know, I'm a bit disturbed. You guys don't know that, to be honest. If if that's being brought to our attention, but we'll ask you to take a look into it as you are um, as you are considering what, how to how to step how to move forward. Um, have individuals been notified themselves, uh, individuals who have been in your custody that their phone calls were illegally recorded? We've, been, we've notified the Bronx Defenders and the Brooklyn Defenders, the, the defender organizations with the specific names we've identified. We've gone, we're not speaking directly with the person in custody, but we, are, we have communicated and, and given the details to the defender organizations that uh, from Brooklyn and Bronx, and we, it is our intention um, um, to do the same for the remaining um, defender organizations. Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna stop here and come back. Um, I see Council Member Holden has his hands up. I'm gonna give him an opportunity to come back. I just wanna say, I mean, this has been one of the most disturbing and upsetting things since I've been the chair of this committee um, that has happened. 
And, you know, it's um, often we do hear these sort of stories or anecdotes and to find, we ask you to investigate them. In this case, we've now still have the medical one. We have the other boroughs that are out there. I am, I am certain we're gonna find out more and this is the beginning of a larger problem here. And um, I think there's an opportunity to, cor to correct it moving forward. But I think for the folks who have had their privacy violated, it's quite unfair to say the least to them and we at the council certainly will be um, waiting for those audit responses, asking for more information about the other calls we've asked for, um, looking at that exact audit process and certainly looking for uh, uh, a change here that is not minuscule, that is, that is drastic to improve operations and audits here. Um, I'll end on this note on that topic, but I'll be back in a couple of minutes after Councilman Roll and ask his questions. Uh, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Holden for now. Um, I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand functions. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. First, we will hear from Council Member Holden, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Powers, and uh, thank you, DOC. I just have a, a few questions. Uh, it's been a rough, rough month for the Department of Corrections. Uh, two inmates have now been released by mistake due to cleric er errors. Unfortunately, another man killed himself inside his own cell this past Friday. And, um, you know, Department of Correction officers had to go on TV and NBC report saying they're working triple shifts. So I sent a letter to Commissioner Brand earlier this year expressing my concerns about correction officers working the triple shifts, including working 24 hours straight. So DOC responded that triple shifts are rare and no Department of Correction staffs are working 24 hours straight. But however, we've been provided documentation from COBA showing that this weekend alone, at the AMKC facility, 58 officers went into triple tours this weekend. 30 of, of them worked a full 24 hours straight. Is this true? So first of all, thank you for your question. I wanted to say that um, I want to go on record saying we value the hardworking members of the department who have proven heroic during a time when we're keeping uh, open three facilities that were scheduled for closure over the last year with fewer staff than we had a year ago, all to support pandemic operations. Um, we are doing everything possible to mitigate the possibility of anyone working into a triple tour. And these are exceptional circumstances. Um, however, the department face, faces a number of staffing challenges including a reduced workforce due to a planned national attrition to reduce the workforce ahead of the transition to bar-based facilities, a rate of daily staff absences, and the inability to redeploy staff who are unable to work in housing areas or posts that interact daily with people in custody. Um, so we, we acknowledge that there have been challenges with respect to our staffing levels. And we are doing everything possible to mitigate um, these issues. So are you asking the city to hire more correction officers in the fiscal year, next fiscal year? Um, because that would be a no brainer then, right? You're bringing up an important point, but the reality that is that that is a longer term solution. And we have a problem that needs to be addressed right now. Um, the department is operating with a larger footprint than this time last year. Like I said before, we're keeping open three jails originally slated for closure with fewer staff members due to attrition. And so what we've been doing um, within internally is we created a, a redeployment program that redeploys officers from headquarters on a biweekly basis to the facilities that have been experiencing severe start, um, staffing shortages. We've also recently, there are a number of temporary duty assigned officers. We actually um, had them redeployed 
to their facilities to assist with the, um, the severe staffing shortages that we've been experiencing. And we've been in close communications with the unions and they also share our concerns. And we're trying to find a way to address these issues, but I'll have uh, Chief Jennings. Yeah, but, uh, but further... we have to ask for more correction officers, right? To hire more, we haven't hired them in two years. And now we're, we're paying the price of that. And, and the correction officers, I mean, how would you like to work 24 hours in a jail straight? I mean, that's dangerous. It's, it's really incredible that you'd even ask officers to work a double shift, but I can understand with the, you know, the budget cuts, but three shifts in a row, 24 hours straight, that is, that is very, very dangerous for everyone. So why not ask for to hire, you know, get it, get it the uh, class going, let's hire some more correction officers. I mean, how many, how many have resigned? I think it was a thousand correction officers have, have resigned in the past two years. Not, not retired, resigned. I mean, that's a problem. So I, again, it's, I understand and I appreciate that point. Um, the fact that a, a class right now is not something that we would be able to access uh, individuals. That's sort of like, that would not provide immediate relief at the moment. Um, but that's something that we are. Yeah, but this, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. You, you're just asking more and more correction officers to work triple shifts. And uh, we're, we're going to have to introduce legislation to prohibit that because that's dangerous. I mean, this is, uh, this, is in, this is insane, actually, to work. You know, and we're not talking just a few officers. This past weekend, 30 officers worked 24 straight hours. Can't go on like this. And the fact that Commissioner Branch tried to sweep it under the rug in, in a letter saying it's rare, it's not rare. It's not rare. And we have to call it out when we see it. And we have to ask for more correction officers because they're being put in harm's way. And if you're not asking for a bigger budget and hire more correction officers, then shame on you. Because then you're just saying, we're gonna continue at, you know, life as, as what it's, what's happening now, which it can't work. And you see all the mistakes that are being made and it can cost people's lives. Thank you, Chair. I wanna leave myself open for another round. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to note, because I was going to bring this issue up as well, in February, uh, I sent a letter with Senator Salazar, chairs the committee in the state Senate on this issue, I believe. Some of our weapon also sent a letter on this issue. He chairs the committee in the assembly. And uh, we were responded on March 9th from the DOC, stating that in the majority of instances where triple tours have occurred, staff have worked three or fewer hours into a triple tour. The numbers I saw from this weekend, I saw individuals working seven, six, five, four hours, uh, I think more than a majority um, into, into the third shift, which is um, very far into the third shift. So thank you, Councilor Holden, for your questions. Um, we're also joined by Councilmember Adams. We're gonna do, I think, um, Councilmember Rosenthal and then Councilmember Adams for questions. Thank you so much, Chair Powers, and thank you, of course, to DOC for this hearing and your answers to our questions. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, uh, budget and um, about Rosie's in particular. Um, I know we noticed $107 million for what looks like very important renovations to Rosie's. Um, prior to moving over to the new location. Um, I just want to confirm, these are things that like have to be done for the next three years. I, I only say that, of course, I want to, you know, make everyone comfortable at Rosie's, you know, air conditioning is required or ADA, you know, accessibility, all that. Um, but, you know, the the advocates are looking for a new site, not one that is connected to the men's, um, the men's um, site in Queens. And people are wondering if we could use that money for um, siting somewhere else. Okay. Good afternoon, Councilman Rosenthal. Thank you for that question. 
So I first like to touch on just one moment, uh, referring back to Council Member Holden's question, and then I'll respond to your question regarding Rosie's. So, Council Member, we are actively. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, we are actively in conversations with OMB regarding a future correction officer class, but as Chair Powers noted in his testimony, our actual uniform headcount exceeds what is authorized at this time. So it's a conversation with OMB we need to have, but we are doing it. Council Member Rosenthal for your question. Yeah, and I just want to uh, specify that apparently Rosie's is at less than 20% capacity. So I'm wondering if the um, repairs are being made for um, the whole facility or like in a certain area, physical area. Sure, so um, we've been undergoing the last few years developing the design and then recently doing the um, competitive seal bid for construction for a state of good repair at the Rosem Singer Center. And those um, repairs would be focusing on um, much needed renovations as it relates to HVAC, as you mentioned, so air conditioning needs, um, ADA compliance. Um, no, no, I know what they're for. I'm just sort of wondering if, um, you know, most importantly, like why renovate the whole building if it's only at 20% capacity and we don't expect that number to go up. So I know what it's for, HVAC. I mean, that's a public record. Okay, sure. Um, so I'd have to go back to look at the specifics of the project, but I don't know that all of the buildings would be under repair because obviously the 800 bed is a much newer facility than the other, the, the original building. But um, the upgrades, as I see, go through various spaces, but it is not affecting every single building. Um, and again, as you noted, it's for compliance measures, fire safety, ADA, and air conditioning needs. Yeah, I, I would really appreciate a better understanding, you know, not right now, sounds like you don't have it, but of what, you know, it sounds, it's the, it sounds questionable given that only 20% of the population is there now. And I'm wondering if they could be housed in a section that um, does have, you know, all the requirements. 20% is, is pretty small. So we don't, you understand where I'm going. Yeah, um, I understand. I'll be happy to get back to you with more information. And then is there any um, consideration of moving the new site uh, to some place different than in Queens attached to the men's facility? I'm not aware of that. Um, this, this is the uh, CDC managed borough based jail in Queens. Um, I'm not aware of that being presented as an idea, but I can certainly find out. Right, I think the advocates are looking for um, the building um, Lincoln Detention Center in Manhattan. And the problem is that it's it's owned by the state and it's not clear that the governor would release it, nor is it clear that the state senator, um, Brian Benjamin, would consider releasing that for a detention site for the Queens facility. And, but that's like a just perfect site, especially in terms of transportation. Um, given that we're talking about women, you know, they're really going to be, thank you. They're really going to be using, needing uh, good transportation for their, for their kids, um, whatever. All right. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, I would love feedback on that. Thank you sure. very much. Thank you. Next we'll hear from council member Adams. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, just wanting to go back to uh, the testimony of my colleague, Council Member Holden, um, for which I agree with everything that he just presented before this forum today. You know, I, I have to be perfectly candid with you. Um, I don't know how many know this, but I'm going to say it once again for this record and for this hearing. I lost my mother three weeks ago, um, unexpectedly. My mother was a retired correction captain um, who was very much supportive of the close of Rikers Island uh, and knew of what went on behind those closed doors and what that culture meant. So I was raised in that culture. 
I, I have to say, Commissioner, that I take issue with your testimony that the 24 hour shifts are exceptional circumstances. I don't believe you. Correction officers are abused by managerial practices that continue to this day. We don't talk about that a whole lot. We talk about a lot of other things, but we do not talk about the mistreatment of correction officers. And so my question, I guess it's just really one question because I'm just so furious right now in knowing that this practice continues and the abuse of correction officers in their time that they put into work, hard jobs, work that is thankless, that quite frankly, a lot of people don't have the stomach to do. So when we take advantage of these peace officers who are now demonized in many places in our city, when we take, continue to abuse them because of managerial practices like triple shifts and make excuses, using COVID as an excuse. Oh no, that was being done to them long before COVID. It continues right now and it continues this past weekend as my colleague just mentioned. So I just would like to know how you continue to justify this abusive practice of these double and triple shifts on these officers who have families and on these incarcerated individuals who have families who both sides are now in jeopardy because of this practice. Council member Adams, uh, first of all, I'd like to express my condolences on the passing of your mom. Um, sorry to hear of your loss. Um, again, we, we acknowledge that our, our staff work very, very hard. And like I mentioned in my testimony earlier, we are dealing with uh, operating facilities that were scheduled to close. And we are sort of, we, we are discussing and continuing to have conversations internally. I will turn it over to Chief um, Jennings to talk more on this. Um, and she can sort of expand on, 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 on the issues that we've been facing. So hi, good morning, ma'am. Um, and again, I too uh, want to give my condolences to you on the loss of your mom. So this past weekend um, was extraordinary. Uh, I worked all weekend along with uh, my uh, assistant chief who had the duty on uh, getting people relieved. And so what we were required to do because one of the things that, that we are occurring is that we're averaging about 1,200 people out sick on a daily basis. I have about another 700 and some odd persons who are unavailable to work on inmate facing posts because of medical uh, restrictions, rather than medically monitored uh, either one or two. And then I have an additional uh, about, about 100 persons who are modified uh, with no contact at all to any person in custody. So what we've been doing, um, and I would welcome a class again. Um, I don't think anyone here at this table is denying that that's something that we would want, but in the now, what we have been doing to offset uh, the amount of overtime that people have been working is that we have put together a redeployment where anyone who works external to a facility has to go back once a week uh, to take up some of the overtime in the facilities. We've also reduced headcount in some of the areas I'm like the court because we're not um, taking the amount of persons to court that we would normally do. So we have reduced those numbers. We're also, we reduce some of the head count in some of the areas or units that normally would not work with the incarcerated population. And so we're now looking at all of the persons who are TDY outside of a facility. And we're now forcing everyone to go back inside so that we can meet and help the staff members who are suffering the most, which are the persons who are working behind the gate. And as a correction person, I did 12 years as a correction officer. So I understand. 
And so not having meals and, and us getting people to provide meals and getting water and uh, food to people on post is important because as you start to get exhausted, mistakes can happen. And so we're trying to uh, eliminate all that we can. And again, like uh, our SCC said, we're operating uh, AMKC, which was supposed to be 50% closed. Uh, now we have just about every house open with the exception of three. I have the Otis Bantam um, Center, which was supposed to be closed. That's fully operational with the exception of four houses. We have people who are showing up or people who the courts are asking to come out for court visits. Uh, those numbers have gone from 1,100 a day to under 100 persons. And then from uh, December 20th of last year was the last time we've had anybody get transferred to state custody. So I have another 300 and some odd persons that are sitting in our custody that we have not been able to send to state custody. And we're only able to, as effective of April 1st, to be able to start transferring persons out of our custody. So our account had, uh, prior to COVID, we had seen a lot that happened with the bail reforms, with working with other uh, outside agencies. And then during COVID, our count was low, but the numbers have picked back up. And so today we're at 5690, when the projection for our count is supposed to be approximately 3,500 persons in custody. I'm sorry, I can't You're on mute. You can't unmute. Thank you. Thank you for taking me off mute. You know, I appreciate everything that you said, but again, I agree with Councilmember Holden. I think that this is something that we're going to have to legislate through. Um, we understand what COVID has done to us across the city in, in every agency and every crack and crevice of this city. However, the abuse of officers, correction officers cannot continue. And the quite frankly, I, what I believe is mismanagement in the DOC, that can't continue either. Thank you. Now we'll return to Chair Powers. Thank you. I will do the, the last, I know there's a couple of follow-up questions, do those and I'll come back. Thanks. Um, so next we'll hear from Council Member Holden. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair, for this uh, quick second round. I appreciate it. I'll try to be brief. Um, so the, the new borough Brace jails aren't going to be built until 2027 at the earliest. Um, so it's not a good idea uh, not to hire more COs, uh, correction officers, for the next six years. And we, we can't. Otherwise, we're going to have triple shifts going on for, for several years. Um, because the mayor, let's face it, the mayor kind of miscalculated the population of the jails, and he did it badly. Um, so we, we can't have the correction officers suffer for the mayor's miscalculations here. But, but let, me, let me just say, uh, the mayor's management report of 2021 shows assaults on correction officers were up 23% this year over last year. Um, why is that? Um, you know, obviously, we heard uh, Commissioner Brand say before, well, it's a more violent, violent population. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, that I mentioned before, a thousand correction officers have resigned, not retired, resigned, because obviously the conditions in the jails are horrendous. We can't keep going on like this without definite answers about um, the classes, you know, new classes going in and hiring more uh, officers. So we really need a definitive on that. We need a plan, not just, well, we're in negotiations. We needed a, in the budget, how many officers should be, be, should be hired and what's the proper staffing level. And then again, what uh, my council member, my colleague said, uh, Adrian Adams said about her mom has been going on for years and that they continue, you guys continue, the correction, uh, the Department of Correction continues 
to put correction officers in harm's way. The, the numbers show it. So I just want to mention one thing about uh, my concern about, in my letter to uh, Commissioner Brand, I, I mentioned about retaliation uh, against officers, correction officers for blowing the whistle on triple shifts in that NBC report. Their faces were blurred out by NBC, but nevertheless, I'm concerned about protecting their identities and ensure, ensuring that there's no retaliation. Um, I, I know you, you, I don't know if I can expect an answer on this, but has there been any effort to learn the identities of these correction officers that spoke to NBC News? No, no. There, there hasn't nothing. been. No. Okay. Well, it, uh, again, if this is a, a concern, um, because how the correction officers are treated, the fact that this past weekend, 30 officers worked the full 24 hour shift, uh, like I mentioned before, cannot happen again. Can you assure me that this won't happen again next weekend? So the department, um, we do, we take all steps necessary to ensure that uh, people do not enter into triples. And if they do, we try to ensure that there is officers on hand to relieve them. And that's done. Time I mean, we're, we're on with, we're, we're in communication with the uh, facility. And also as Chief Jennings mentioned, works hand in hand to ensuring that officers are relieved if they are, do go into a triple to work. Nobody, and, nobody should go into a triple. Okay, that should be outlawed. And again, we're working on legislation for that. That should be outlawed. It's unsafe. And the corrections, the Department of Corrections should understand that. It's dangerous, period, for everyone. Thank you, Chair. Next, Thank we will you. hear from Council Member Rosenthal. Sorry. Time starts now. Great. Thank you so much. You know, I'm going to come back to talking about the about Rosie's um, and, and ask some questions that you might know the answers to now. So where in the building are the women housed? So, so this is Chief Jennings, they house all over the facilities. So they're at 20%, the building's at 20% capacity and you have them housed all throughout the building? That is correct. How, how does that make sense? Is that because of COVID or something else? So it, it's twofold. So yes, because some of the houses when they're quarantined, we have to open up new housing areas. We also have, uh, if we have a house of uh, two women that may be for a uh, maternity unit, then that's all that we have. We would have to house have them housed together. We are also housing our young adult population separate than our adult population. And then we have special Wait, housing. That's male and female? I mean, male? I'm, I'm sorry? What gender young adult? Oh, I said our young adults are housed separate and apart from the adults. So is that both genders are currently in the Rosie's complex? Yeah. Young adults. No, no ma'am, young adults. Women. Okay. Women. Women, that's all I was asking. Thank mm -hmm. you. Well, um, I'd actually, I'd love to see sort of that diagrammed out because, and I understand the point, I really do. I really understand the point. If there are different needs in different sections, um, you have to do that. But, you know, as so, so I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. So maybe if you could let us know sort of by building, you know, what's being used and what needs to be renovated. I think that would be really helpful. Just trying to wrap my head around 170 million for um, something that's not going to be used at all in three years, but of course don't want to, you know, put anyone in, uh, you know, a, a, a dangerous situation. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. You can get that back to staff, committee staff. Yes. Yes. We will provide that to you. Okay. Is that hard to do? Can you get that back sooner rather than later? 
Well, every day we have a housing area plan, so we know what houses are open and how many people are there. And that comes out on a daily basis. Oh, great. So just pop them over. That'd be great. And I guess what I'd love is, you know, today's and then um, pick a day uh, that was pre-COVID. That would be, that would show the sort of difference in um, quantity of people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to questions. I, I want to just go back to one question, which is I was one of the first questions I asked, and I just want to clarify again here for the record. On the phone calls, was the first time and the first moment, or the, I guess the timing of when the DOC was first made aware of this being an issue was December of 2020? Can you confirm that? For, for the, the issues that the Bronx Defender um, raised with us, where, which prompted us to reach out to Securus, uh, yes, I mean, that's, that's where we got notice from the Bronx. Um, that there were these issues. Now, as I mentioned in my earlier testimony, through the years we've gotten we've gotten phone calls from people um, throughout the years here and there. It's it wasn't um, what we believe was a, a, a systemic issue. Um, and um, I do want to just um, clarify. Let me just, let me just, let me just get, let me just go back to that question for that answer for a second. Did was did anybody bring forward? a concern to the department last year in 2020, prior to December, about the potential wrongful recording of phone calls? I, I, I believe that there have been, um, there have been one off um, requests and there may be a few here and there, but it was not in a system, what we thought was a systemic lip, um, level. So I'm are not- you in, are, you in gotten, are you in receipt of any concerns in 2020 prior to December of phone calls being recorded that forget systemic I'm asking a, a very clear question in 2020 is there any concerns brought to the Department of Corrections about phone calls being wrongfully recorded yes I, I and I said to you um, that there were um, calls I even mentioned um, when we went on pause there were calls I mean, November, I know there, there must have been um, a call that, you know, that we get, we get communications here and there about inquiries. Uh, so there are, um, it's just, again, not um, what we perceived or considered a systemic issue. So when a, when a complaint comes in to the Department of Corrections saying, we have a concern, public defense group, client, attorney, we have, I or I have a concern that there might be calls being recorded that should not be recorded, attorney-client privilege, whatever it might be, what happens to those? Well, what we try to do is find out, um, have you um, attempted to place that call in a do not record list? Sometimes people, uh, like I said, uh, someone will, uh, will speak with one of their clients on their personal cell phone number or a number that was not registered. And then we will receive calls. And then, then um, there may be um, other times where we get. It's hard to it's hard to say every single detail, but we're happy to get back to you with more information. I did, Chair Powers. May I yeah. just yeah, yeah, yep, yep. clarify one? Um, when you also asked uh, earlier about the dates of the calls uh, predating uh, March two thousand twenty. Uh, I wanted to just let you know that some of the calls that we have turned over to the DA and to the Bronx offenders do cover calls that predate March 2020. The information that we looked at is the date that those calls were accessed for purposes of turning over. A call may have taken place before March, but you were accessed in March or after. Is that what right, you mean? in March 2020 and February 2021. I wanted to make that clarification. And there may be, um, and you also asked about other law enforcement. Um, like I said, um, the um, the non city the non city law enforcement entities they all have to subpoena. Um, and when, with the, the Department of Investigation, they may have access without a subpoena. 
because they have access to calls on their own. So, I so just the department of investigation that. would have access to calls without a subpoena. Yes. Yes. Okay. District attorneys are clarifications. Okay, thank you for that clarification on both counts. Um, are you in receipt of any written or verbal comment or complaint in 2020? I'm just, I'm, I want to stay on this topic for a second. I understand that the, in December, a systemic issue became aware to the department. Prior to that in 2020, March, May, you name it, any of those months. Leading up, let's say from March 2020, before Bronx Defender Services issue became available, became known in December. Did the department have any complaints come forward or comment or concerns being raised by any organization that they're potentially their calls were being recorded wrongfully? I, I said that I, I said that in March of 2020. Um, and around the time when there was a pause, when people were um, not, they were not working from their offices, they were working from home. There was, um, the, we had outreach from the defender organizations to figure out how to place those phone calls, properly register those phone calls, because people were communicating and having attorney-client communications, but because they, the number wasn't properly registered, uh, we would receive calls. And then we worked uh, with our IT department to, uh, and we worked to remedy that situation. Um, so is so, there, so any, any of the issues that are brought to your attention by the department were because of the only ones that you're aware of prior to that were instances where an individual was using their cell phone or a number that was different. And then were, and then, uh, and then it brought forward the department put those onto the do not record list. Is that, the it's a combination, Chair Powers. I I can say that um, that there may have been one-off phone calls or one-off um, um, communications with the department, uh, and that uh, we would have um, re re remedied it close in time, in real time, and addressed. So I can't say here today that there was never another call or never another notification to the department that there. Was it was was a concern? What I can say is that we received at this uh, inquiry from the Bronx about privileged communications being turned over to the district attorney, and from there we immediately responded and had Securus investigate. And from my prior testimony, you know that um, all the following steps that occurred. And did it ever occur to you that you might want to do an audit of your entire system in light of group people coming forward, groups coming forward to raise an issue about these recordings? Pardon? I, I guess I guess my question is, it, it does sound to me like organizations or individuals have come forward and some may have been related to the COVID change and so the way people were working, perhaps some were not. And also that um, in, um, I, I have communicated this with you in, in various months of 2020, the potential issue. I think what I'm hearing from the agency is that changes in COVID led to different, you know, way people are behaving and so numbers didn't make it. It sounds to me though, perhaps, that for some period of time, folks were coming forward with these complaints or concerns and only until they made their way into the hands of a district attorney did the agency take it seriously enough to go and investigate and audit it. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I would say that um, when um, I, I, would, I would respectfully um, disagree, Chair Powers, um, we take it seriously. And uh, when we saw the need to do a wholesale audit, we, we asked Securus to do that. We take it very seriously and moving forward, it is our goal to make sure that all the quality assurance provisions that we put in place will protect private communications. Did Are you aware of any numbers that prior to, any numbers communicated to you before November 2020 that were not in the do not record list and never made it? Like, it sounds to me like some, some of these were cell phones that didn't make or, or changes in numbers and some were issues that were being raised that were more systemic. 
why would you, why would the agency only wait until they made their hands into the district attorneys to do a larger look at the entire system? Because we did not see this as a systemic issue. And anytime we had an inquiry from any of the defender organizations, if there were questions, we would remedy that. And then we would, if we did not hear from that individual attorney again, it to us would appear that the issue was resolved. Um, but we, again, we take this very seriously. We're committed to doing what's right here and to making sure that whatever moving forward, that everybody, um, that, that people, um, their communications with their attorney are confidential. Okay, but you will acknowledge that in organizations did reach out to you in the year 2020 prior to your discovery, may, alerting you of the potential that their calls were recorded. You would confirm that, is that correct? As I've testified, um, I, I stand by what I've testified to. So the answer is yes, correct? It's it's whatever, I the answer is what I've given testimony all day about this. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. I, my testimony is what I stand by. Um, and the answer is we, we've received communications um, for a variety of reasons. We did not think that this was a systemic issue that needed to um, be audited by um, securists for all defender organizations. I know, but I guess, I guess that is my exact issue here, that organizations or individuals and others came forward last year in the middle of the year during COVID, more than one, and noted that there was an issue here. And only at the point where it made its hands into the district attorney's hands did the agency decide to go back and do a larger- No, that's not true. Um, if, the Bronx defend, if the Bronx defenders, the Bronx defend would alerted the Bronx defenders is that they received privileged communications through pretrial discovery. So they raised that with us. Um, if they had raised it sooner um, from other, co other contexts, we would have taken similar action. But this, that's, to me, that's the triggering event that led the Bronx offender to share that information with us. And then we immediately looked into that matter. It's not because of the disclosure to the DA, it's because Bronx defender um, asked us to look into it and said that there was an inadvertent disclosure. I, I believe other organizations came forward prior to that and with similar concerns. Is that, is that true? I, um, if someone were, I'd have to go back and see what, what kind of communications um, were received by which defender organizations to, um, to look into that. Okay, I mean, I, I believe with some reasonable confidence that another, at least other, other organizations came forward in 2020 and re revealed a concern to the agents, to the Department of Corrections, that both their phone calls were not, be, were being recorded inappropriately. And that in some cases, those were being handed over to the district attorneys. That is what my belief, we will, we will follow up with you. I, I well, if you can share that information with us, we'll be happy to look into that and then we can um, identify the issue. But we're happy to look into that if you were to share that information with us. I, so I, I will share that with you. I, I believe you have it already. I believe DOC staff has it already. I believe there's been meetings on this topic and I have a belief and I will, I will apologize if I'm wrong, but I have a belief that there were other instances where folks brought this forward in 2020 and did not receive the attention that this more recent one has found. And we will follow up with you on that, but that is very deeply disturbing and concerning to find out that at the end of last year, with other prior knowledge of this, is, at, is, is the point where the agency took steps to remediate and only after an audit found that this problem was much larger than the original issue. And I am only deeply concerned to find that out in the middle of this hearing. Um, Did you guys want to add anything to that before I before I move on? No, not at this time. Um, I'm going to move on just quick, quickly to other issues that have been at the department um, recently or have a, a concern the, the the department. The past two weeks, we've had two individuals who were charged with murder and attempted murder who have been mistakenly released from DLC custody. 
Can you let us know what the role is of the DOC in those two releases? And also after the first release, what, was, what steps were taken to prevent another one from happening, which unfortunately did happen? As public safety professionals, we take the discharge of a person from custody extremely seriously. And the two grave recent discharge errors are completely unacceptable. I would like to be clear though, that one of the individuals was properly released by the department based on paperwork we received from the Office of Court Administration. With regards to the others, the department has taken swift action to investigate this serious mistake and has suspended four staff members in conjunction with this event. Um, I'm gonna now turn it over to Chief of Staff, Brenda Cook, to, to, to elaborate on the details of these cases. Thank you. Um, as the, the first deputy commissioner indicated, um, there were uh, two releases from custody, uh, one of which uh, was uh, due to the serious mistake of the Department of Correction. Uh, that was the, um, uh, the discharge of, of uh, an individual named Mr. Bugs. Uh, he was discharged um, um, on March 9th from custody. The department's uh, discharge was a mistake um, because paperwork was received from the court sentencing um, Mr. Bugs to a, a sentence of 30 days on a criminal contempt charge. Uh, the paperwork was uh, provided um, from the court uh, uh, using the indictment number of his underlying murder uh, case charge that was before that same judge. Uh, when the department uh, processed the sentence, and calculated Mr. Bugs' jail time um, for that uh, for his time in custody. Uh, they uh, credited him uh, with he had served enough time for, for a 30 day sentence, and then therefore processed his discharge. Uh, that was that was a serious mistake, as the first deputy commissioner identified. Um, he he was uh, erroneously discharged, and those staff members were uh, immediately identified through an investigation, suspended, and uh, the, the remainder of their discipline um, as appropriate is, is, on, is ongoing. With respect to the second um, discharge of a serious um, a violent, uh, alleged violent uh, offender, um, that um, individual, Mr. Meekins, was released last week by the Department of Correction. That release was uh, proper based on the paperwork that uh, OCA provided the, the provided to us. Mr. Meekins um, and some had two uh, cases pending and we received dispositions for uh, the status of his custody for each of those cases separately. Uh, one, uh, one paper um, provided for his bail to be reduced from 300,000 to a dollar and in accordance with uh, local law, um, the, we do not um, hold people then on the dollar bail. His second case um, was a uh, uh, the custody status was uh, changed to ROR or release on their own cognizance. So the Department of Correction staff uh, received those um, disposition uh, documents from the court and properly applied them to Mr. Meekins uh, cases and then it therefore released him from custody. Mr. Meekins um, uh, was then identified uh, in the uh, days thereafter as uh, not being someone that the court and the district attorney's office had intended uh, to have released, and he has since um, uh, surrendered and returned to custody. You have one individual in custody, the other one is still. Correct. In yes, correct. Um, okay. Um, and Sorry, can you share with us just just again what what steps are being taken? I know that there are multiple agencies included involved here, but can you tell us what steps that DOC is taking to prevent this from happening again? The two are very deeply concerning. One individual still being um, out out. Um, can you please share with us the protocols that are being put in place right now to prevent that? Sure, then thank you for that uh, question again. Uh, the department with, um, well, uh, erroneous uh, discharges on the mistake, serious mistake of the department are, um, are thankfully infrequent. Um, we take each case seriously and um, address each case um, um, uh, specifically. And, and for that, I'll uh, turn it over to Chief Jennings to identify uh, some of the retraining and the uh, uh, 
uh, protocols that um, we can uh, identify and we have identified for staff with respect to the uh, proper processing of paperwork um, related to sentence commitment and discharge. So, uh, yes. So, yes. Uh, Any time in which we have an erroneous discharge, one of the things is that we look at the time of the member of service uh, who actually worked on the discharge. So, and then we come up with uh, retraining for staff agency wide. So, one of the things that we've done differently is that uh, we have created a robust uh, training schedule for our new uh, assistant deputy wardens where they uh, go through the academy and bail and discharge um, and paperwork is part of the training. And that's also being done for the captains. Uh, we just recently uh, lost one of our captains assigned to the academy to retirement who was in charge of the general office training. And so we have taken on a replacement staff member uh, for that person to ensure that we keep up with uh, all of the uh, training that's necessary uh, for staff at the courts and in the facilities that are processing discharge. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, but this is, I want to go back to another, an issue I raised earlier. On March 8th, on May 8th, 2020, the Department of Correction News should be, have been in receipt of a alert from one of the organizations about the DA having more than multiple calls with attorneys showing up in discovery and had flagged this issue for your folks and uh, had sent this directly to Department of Corrections. And this in this in this correspondence, and I will we will we will provide you more information. The attorneys alerted the I'm just being clear, alerted the Department of Correction of a matter where the district attorney had records of the phone calls. They also, I believe, was a meeting weeks after that with the agency and that organization on this very issue. That was six months before or more before you decided to do an audit to find out the larger issue at hand. I, I don't feel, to be very frank, that you guys have provided us real the, the information here today that we've asked. I've asked 45 questions and only now do I find out in this that another organization earlier in the year brought this forward. The answer from the agency here is that you didn't think it was a systemic issue, so you didn't follow up on it. Maybe follow up with a specific complaint. This issue has been going on at the minimum. I think another organization brought this to your attention in early March. There's when there's multiple complaints from organizations. I it is, I I can't even figure out how to take the remainder of that year, from March to May to November to December. I guess even rather, to investigate a larger systemic issue here. And now individuals have had their entire privacy violated because of that. I have no further questions for the agency, but I will ask, we have immediate answers onto what happened, immediate recounting of other complaints and organizations that came forward with this complaint, because I we know of two, and we get that audit done immediately because this is so unacceptable and it's unacceptable to go three hours into a hearing or two hours into a hearing and only then find out more organizations are coming forward to say that they also had this similar issue. They flagged this issue for you. And I feel like we haven't gotten the full picture here today. And I also feel that this issue could have been resolved a year ago, maybe, maybe 10 months ago. I have no further questions. We'll go into the Department of Probation. Thank you. Um, next, we'll move on to the Department of Probation. Um, Chair Powers, did you want to say a few words before I swear them in? I will be happy to say a few words before I swear them in. Um, 
we are going to move on now to the bu uh, more budget focused uh, testimony here from the Department of Probation. And um, let me just get to my, um, well, let's just get, the, I, I wanna thank the Department of Probation uh, for being here today and their ongoing work. We know they have such an important role, sometimes underestimated and undervalued perhaps in the city. Um, so I want to I want to welcome them up and, um, and to talk about their budget for the forthcoming year, and uh, we can call them up if you want to swear them in. I will now administer the oath to the members of the Department of Probation. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Anna Bermudez. Yes. Sharon Goodwin. Yes. Janine Gray. No, oh, I think she's muted. Yes. Thank you. Michael Fort. Yes. And Wayne McKinsey. I do. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from Commissioner Anna Bermudez. You may begin when ready. Afternoon, Chair Powers, and members of the Criminal Justice Committee. I'm Anna Bermudez, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Probation. With me today is my cabinet, Deputy Commissioners Tron Goodwin, Janine Gray, Michael Forte, and General Counsel Wayne McKenzie. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the important work of the Department of Probation and its preliminary fiscal year 2022 budget. I particularly want to acknowledge the newer members of this committee. I think I saw um, Council Member Diaz uh, present. Hello. Uh, I look forward to working with you, closely with you, um, and Council Members Riley and Ben Bramer um, as well. So I, I know that I've said this before, uh, but in this past year of all years, I could not be prouder of this incredible department. The level of resiliency and adaptability shown by everyone, um, the people we serve, community partners, and especially our dedicated staff during this extremely difficult time in both our cities and nation's history continues to amaze me. Throughout this pandemic, we were never on pause. Um, rather, DOP has continuously and consistently adapted and responded to this crisis while simultaneously engaging in the important work of community justice because our clients and the communities they call home need us and we need them. Our neighborhood opportunity network neighborhoods, which I'll discuss later, are some of the areas hit hardest by COVID. This inequity exacerbated by decades of economic and other disadvantages and their disproportionate impact on people of color is not new. Combating this reality has been foundational to our work for the better part of the last decade. And the relationships we have built with the communities have never been more important and stronger than during this pandemic. As the city's largest alternative to incarceration, I'm proud of this department's critical role in safely supervising people on probation throughout the five boroughs. In 2020, probation provided intake, investigation, and supervision services for nearly 50,000 cases and directly supervised 18,500 adults and 1,500 adolescents. That is about four times the average New York City jail daily census and for a significantly lower cost than incarceration. For fiscal year 2022, the Department of Probation has a preliminary budget of $119.3 million as compared to our fiscal year 2021 adopted budget of 123.7 million. When compared to our current budget of $125.3 million, the fiscal year 22 preliminary budget is 6.1 million or 5.2% less, which is primarily attributable to intercity funding historically added to our budget post adoption. Of the $119.3 million allocated to our preliminary budget, 68% or 81.1 million is for personal services and 32% or 38.1 million is for other than personal services. 98.3 million are city tax levy funds, 14.6 million are state funds, and 6.3 million are intercity funds. State funding, which at one time reimbursed almost half of local probation costs, now provides only 11% of the 
of our operating costs. Now, never on pause means, for example, that last year, despite the pandemic, our intelligence unit, our intel unit alone, conducted 3,413 field visits and 1,134 enforcement actions, which included gang-related investigations, DUI, field visit checks, failure to report home visits, bench warrant enforcement actions, responding to NYPD domestic incident reports, and transporting prisoners to and from other jurisdictions. These actions done with PPE and utilizing proper safety protocols resulted in the recovery of firearms, drugs, and other contraband, allowing us to balance risk management safely and effectively with risk reduction, which is the other big part of our job. Even during these trying times, nearly 90% of people successfully complete probation in New York City, of which one in five earn an early discharge. Therefore, I am confident that our evidence-based practices and one-size-fits-one interventions will continue to provide the best opportunities to the people we serve while adapting to the needs and crises of the present day. To that end, I wanna brief you further on our COVID-19 response, our continued efforts to best serve our young people with age-appropriate interventions and the crucial and continuing work of our nationally recognized Neighborhood Opportunity Network, better known as NEONT. No doubt you have already heard countless hours of testimony as to how government agencies have had to adapt during this crisis. The department tackled similar operational challenges, um, such as ensuring that all our staff were equipped with um, personal protective equipment, the technology to work remotely, and protocols for essential services. We also provided assistance to our officers facing increased secondary trauma exposure and work to decrease the stress and compassion fatigue that may impact their health and work um, through ongoing professionally facilitated support groups. For the people we serve, we met them where they were in terms of technology accessibility, internet access, and increased focus on the health and safety of themselves and their families. Additionally, we created new opportunities, including hashtag no knockout COVID and neon summer. Young people who participate in DOP's Credible Messenger Mentoring programs live in some of the communities most impacted by COVID-19. Despite the pandemic, these young people remained connected to their mentors and each other via remote group and individual communications and sessions. With Young Men's Initiative support, DOP activated youth from nearly a dozen different mentoring programs to create effective peer-to-peer -peer messaging campaigns. And who better to reach young people than other young people? In the form of drawings, memes, and videos promoting the need for social distancing, the youth-driven knockout COVID campaign was born. Youth received stipends for participation and along with their mentors played a critical leadership role in protecting our public health. DOP and YMI coordinated a social media thunderclap, which included multiple city agencies, community-based organizations, and other stakeholders. You can spot these young people's fantastic work at Link NYC kiosks across the city. In the wake of last year's initial uncertainty about SYEP, DOP began planning virtual paid summer programming, relying on its existing infrastructure and expertise in close, its close network of partner providers and YMI support. Neon Summer provided young people with a range of engaging activities from culturally competent, experienced providers, connections to crisis resources for them and their families, emotional support, skills building workshops and activities, and critically stipends. Approximately 2,700 young people between the ages of 14 to 24 who were connected to DOP or residing in our neon neighborhoods participated. Programming included, programming included a variety of both fun and skills building modules offered by existing and new DOP partners, such as the Made in New York Animation Project, Freeverse, Neon Arts, and Neon Photography. Civic engagement workshops were given, community benefit projects, and even yoga and mindfulness um, were offered as well. Included with your testimony actually is the Neon Summer Magazine, um, which is a beautiful compilation of the powerful work that was created, written, and photographed by the participants. So it's really worth a read. Um, the Made in New York animation project has been more than a, a component of Neon Summer actually. We worked in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment um, to bring the animation project to youth um, citywide and year round. Participants learned how to use professional animation software as they collaboratively create short films telling their own stories. 
our therapists then were also in, in the mix, are in the mix working with the participants, providing much needed trauma-informed care and support, which has been more critical than ever over this past year, uh, which has been extremely challenging. At DOP, we know our young people have tremendous potential and therefore continue to deepen our work, building the skills they need to access the opportunities they want. As the one agency working at almost all system points along the juvenile justice continuum, our department experienced the greatest impact from Raise the Age. Since inception, probation has seen a 50% increase in the number of intakes um, and has served over 5,000 additional youth, providing justice-involved young people and their families with developmentally appropriate services while keeping them safely in their communities. We accomplished this by expanding our current operations, building upon our evidence-based juvenile services and creating crucial new opportunities for our young people. First, prior to COVID, we secured dedicated space for our officers in the youth parts, allowing us to begin working holistically with young people and their families as soon as their case is removed from adult court. Second, we expanded our family court alternative to detention program known as intensive community monitoring or ICM to the youth parts. Um, ICM is uh, specifically available to young people who otherwise would be detained while their case is resolved. Third, we built um, on our incredibly successful Arches Transformative Mentoring Program model to create plus mentoring for youth aged 13 to 18 in the youth parts and family courts who display high risk behavior. Plus mentoring on Arches, as well as some of our other group interventions have all continued to operate either remotely or um, safely in person so as not to lose the important community of support needed during this time. We're also relaunch, relaunching our Anyone Can Excel or our ACE model of supervision, which is a, size, a one size fits one also approach to address the unique needs and challenges for facing young adults, 16 to 24 under probation supervision in adult court. ACE is an evidence-based youth informed model focusing on mentorship, goal setting, core life skills, job preparation and accountability. The model is grounded in what works to improve outcomes for adolescents and young adults, the science of adolescent brain development, um, the risk, need, and responsivity principle that we use, motivational interviewing, and both restorative and positive youth justice. Probation officers function as coaches as opposed to referees, and ACE teams create a sense of belonging and hope for a successful future outside the justice system. The model prioritizes the voices of young people and helps them build the skills to advocate for their own autonomy, self-efficacy, and a positive life of their own making. Most of all, ACE provides a strong community for all involved, as evidenced by ACE youth, the ACE youth calling to check in on the health and safety of their POs while, you know, during the pandemic. Um, though always the case, but especially now, much of our most critical work occurs in communities. As you may know, our NEONs were created in, and most importantly with, the seven communities that many of our uh, of people on probation call home, the South Bronx, Harlem, Jamaica, Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, East New York, and Northern Staten Island. Similar to the work now being done by the Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity in establishing tree neighborhoods, neon neighborhoods coincide with the findings of the seven neighborhood stu study conducted by incarcerated men at the Green Haven Correctional Facility back in 1979. That seminal piece of research revealed that a vast majority of men incarcerated in New York State prisons came from seven neighborhoods in our city. The same challenges impacting these neighborhoods have sadly been exacerbated by the pandemic as they are some of the city's most impacted communities during the COVID-19 crisis. Our NEONs strive to have the opposite impact, serving as engines of equity by working with residents and service providers to develop solutions from the ground up invest valuable resources and help to restore a sense of agency in the communities. And we're seeing the results pay off. Due to our longstanding commitment, engaging the people we serve, their families and their communities, the residents of our neon neighborhoods are successfully completing probation at a rate equivalent to residents of neighborhoods that do not have these structural challenges. Though there is still a lot more work to do, I am proud of this department's contribution toward ensuring that justice system outcomes are not solely defined by a person's zip code. Part of what makes the NEON model so powerful is how it grows and evolves to meet our community's needs. 
Our neon nutrition kitchens, the brainchild of committed probation officers who are feeding hungry clients, have been a lifeline over the past year. As we saw the emerging need, we increased capacity, feeding almost 400,000 people last year. That is an unimaginable fourfold increase from 2019. And the need continues as over the last two months, we have fed over 60,000 people already. Thankfully, we have had great partners in this work through donations from Target, Stop and Shop, Baldor, Boar's Head and Driscoll Foods. And one of our most successful partnerships is thanks to your colleague, Council Member Vanessa Gibson and the New York Yankees. Council Member Gibson arranged for the Yankees to donate to struggling local businesses and then paired those businesses with local community organizations providing aid. The South Bronx Neon was paired with Grocery 846, who provided our Bronx Nutrition Kitchen with over $5,000 worth of food that we distributed to the community. We also successfully partnered with the Test and Trace Corps and Health and Hospitals to provide pop-up COVID self-testing sites. For many of the people we serve, it is hard enough to find and keep a job even during the best of times, let alone during a global pandemic that has gutted entire sectors of our community. Our, last initi our latest initiative, Neon Works, was designed in response to what we saw as a gap in existing resources for residents of Neon neighborhoods. A truly one size fits one initiative, Neon Works was designed in partnership with YMI, the Center for Youth Employment and the Mayor's Office of, uh, for Economic Opportunity to fill that gap. It offers an array of professional development workshops and supports, connections to education and career exploration opportunities and is open to people on probation and other neighborhood residents with a particular focus on young adults ages 16 to 24. Our seven um, Neon Works CBO providers are closely connected to our Neon stakeholder groups who have been advising them on community needs, interests, and potential avenues for, of recruiting participants. Neon Works has offered virtual workshops on multiple topics such as financial literacy, conflict resolution, and identifying personal strengths and core values, to name a few. As we emerge from the wake of this pandemic, Neon Works is another way to ensure that the people we serve have both access and skills to be able to thrive, not just survive, in what, they, in what will likely be an extremely challenging job market moving forward even. One sector in particular, arts and culture, which is a big part of what makes New York, New York, has been devastated by this crisis. Two thirds of the jobs in the city's arts and cultural sector are reportedly gone. This is especially damaging as artistic and cultural expression is necessary for processing and understanding the human condition. I know I am preaching to the choir here, but I want to again thank the council for its, um, sorry, uh, for its an innovative, cr innovative criminal justice programs initiative and its support of, the, of Neon Arts our partnership with Carnegie Hall that provides high quality arts and cultural programming through our stakeholder groups. Throughout the pandemic, Neon Arts continued to innovate and adapt as well, reaching over 800 youth, um, another 800 youth. And similarly, our Neon Photography Program has had over 400 participants with work currently on display at Columbia University and in two virtual galleries, as well as exhibitions later this year at Denise B. Bro Fine Art and the Islip Art Museum. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And moreover, thank you council members for the incredible and continued support you have shown this department and the people we serve. Because at the end of the day, that is who this is all about, the people we serve. The people we serve who predominantly live in seven New York City communities that have endured decades of concentrated disadvantages and disproportionate representation in the prison and justice system pipelines. And therefore the focus of much of our work and resources. The people we serve, the vast majority of whom are people of color, are brilliant, strong, creative, and resilient, as evidenced by the countless examples you have just heard. All of this work has laid a solid foundation for a more fair and just future, one that is already returning significant dividends on our collective investment, particularly in the area of equitable justice system outcomes. However, as we emerge from the pandemic, the challenges being faced by the people we serve, both those on probation and in our neon neighborhoods, have never been greater and will surely continue to test the mettle of this department, our incredible staff and our dedicated partners. Every dollar invested 
or disinvested, frankly, in this department, which bears repeating functions at a cost of roughly 90 times less than the cost of incarceration and with far better outcomes, will either further drive this important work forward or undercut this foundation and begin to reverse critical progress. With that, I want again to thank the council uh, for its commitment to equity for the people of New York. We're pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. And I gave you short shrift in my opening uh, by skipping it, but your testimony covered a lot of the work that your agency has been doing uh, before COVID and during COVID. And we thank you for the work you're doing uh, throughout the city, including at Carnegie Hall in my district, the NEON program. Um, I have a few questions, but I see Councilmember Beholden has his hand up. So let me go to him first, and then I'll come back with a few questions myself. Thank you. Time starts now. Oh, uh, thank you, Chair, for that. That's terrific that you put me on first. Um, Commissioner, I just want to say uh, it's great to see you again. And uh, I want to echo what you said about the uh, NEON, the Neighborhood Opportunity Network, especially NEON Arts, which uh, I said, whatever the budget, we should double. I said that a couple of years ago, we should now triple because of uh, the COVID. And it's uh, such a great investment. Um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful win-win investment in people, including youth, um, and they're our most uh, vulnerable population. But I saw, like I said, I saw the results of Neon Arts. Uh, they they uh, invest in the individual and they teach skills, but more, more importantly, it helps each participant feel that they have something to offer society, which uh, in, the, in the photography program, by the way, add uh, my office to the list of the galleries. Oh, that's that we, right. Yes. We still have... I still have, I guess, about 50 photographs on the wall framed that you were uh, so gracious to uh, supply us with. And each person that comes in is, is amazed that th these are students uh, who are, have just been looking at photography for a short time. And they're, they're, many of them are look professional. So I, I just want to say that's still up. It's still a, a big part of my office and a very popular part of it. Um, but I, I just want to ask a question about the investment um, in the uh, neon, uh, and I'm not just talking about the arts, there's sports and there's kitchen and so forth, but um, what, what, what can we expect? I mean, how has the COVID uh, impacted that program? And my second question is, um, does the participation in the neon program lead to internships in the industries? So um, in terms of the, of the programming in, in, in the, out of the neons, We've been able to pivot and, you know, really be able to offer almost everything uh, virtually. That's where, you know, Neon Summer was all also um, was out of our Neons. Uh, Neon Works now is such. Arches also switched to uh, all our anti-violence programs, uh, switched to virtual. Um, so, you know, and the, and the Nutrition Kitchens, we were able, because the offices, um, we're not being used for in-person um, client meetings that those shifted also completely to um, to the field to 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 you know in their in the neighborhoods um, we were we've been able to do the community days for uh, the nutrition kitchen three times a week so um, so that's been that's been helpful in expanding the reach of the neons that way um, and also allowed us for example to provide PPE to people who are online to, you know, disseminate information about, you know, the CDC guidelines, all that stuff. So, so that, you know, we feel pretty good that we were able to still leverage the neons throughout this whole process. Um, and, you know, uh, and I think there was the second part to your question, oh, the, you know, providing internships. We try as best we can, you know, uh, it's not a built-in, uh, you know, component of, of the neon programming, uh, but we're always hustling for, you know, uh, you know, things like that. So, so it's not an official part of, of the programming though. Uh, it, it might be because I think that would offer, yeah. you know, some of the, the industry, for instance, in my district, I have um, some uh, two, two actually very large film studios, which, you know, would love to probably get some interns uh, in the film area, even some of the students uh, in photography, who I thought were very professional, 
and they just needed a, a chance. And then these, these businesses, and they're exploding and they have a lot of money, could invest in our youth, could invest in the, um, obviously, the uh, individuals that are at risk, but they could give them a wonderful new outlook on life where they have a career they're needed. So I'd, I'd be willing to help out with the internship program. Some, uh, maybe we could have an, um, uh, a meeting with some of the uh, studios and see if they uh, would like to invest in, in uh, obviously the NEON program. Because I get, I get a lot of, of um, when I have a lot of meetings with the industry, they say we're expanding at a tremendous pace. And, yeah. and New as- York is, is obviously becoming a center for entertainment. It has been for years, but it's yeah. becoming even larger. So I think that's an area that we can we can get some growth, and I'd be happy to set up meetings uh, with the individuals from these uh, yeah, these businesses. So let's talk about great. that. Yeah, um, and I, actually, I failed to mention that our the the Made in New York pro- program does have some built-in um, internships within the program, and then they do t- that. That's more also tries to connect young people with the with the uh, animation field. Great, thank you, Commissioner. You know, for your leadership. Thank you so much for for all that you do. Uh, and again, uh, I, I will support the Neon uh, Arts definitely, and and additional some additional Neon programs. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you. I just want to follow up with a few questions uh, as well. A um, couple of things, just budget related. One is, were there any new needs from the department that were requested but not included? in the preliminary plan or any needs that have been delayed due to COVID? Uh, no, we're, we're in the process of, you know, uh, still working out some, uh, some pieces of, of some of our needs, but, but, uh, but I think we're in good shape uh, in that regard. And you have a budget of, I believe it's $119 million. Do you feel like you're adequately funded right now to carry out the duties that you're charged with here in the city? At the moment, we're, I think we're on that, precipice of like yes but any more cuts is going to hurt us you know um so so that's that's where we are right now okay um i want to just ask you about an initiative that the council had passed in 2020 is legislation i had sponsored to establish a local release commission that is uh allowed under state law we we authorized it here locally both due to covid uh, and non-covid reasons um can you give us an update that was passed in june 2020 it's now March. Um, uh, can you tell us where you are in setting that up, uh, what the appointment and where you are in the appointment process for people to serve on that commission? So there's been progress in that and uh, the vetting process for commission members is in full swing. So uh, I'm hopeful that we will be uh, you know, constituting the full uh, commission soon. Do you have a timeline? I, I wish I did, I actually don't. Uh, but I, we'll be working together, I'm sure, throughout this. Okay. Do you see any barriers to making that operational? No. No, I think we have what the right plan for it. Okay. Um, one of the things we you know, have talked about a little bit in the in the council, but has certainly become a citywide issue in the last year or so, is a, nation, a nationwide as well as the rise of gun violence in the city. Can you talk to us the role that DOP plays with other agencies to address gun violence? Well, we definitely uh, we've been heavily involved, uh, you know, with all the ceasefire, uh, you know, uh, efforts throughout the, throughout the years, um, and uh, there are a couple of new initiatives that are uh, uh, being formed where we are also uh, a big component of that. Um, we, you know, so we work together with. Um, uh, NYPD, we're also part of the youth stat team. Um, and so, so we work very closely with other agencies um, to collaborate around this issue that takes just all of us, <laughs> you know, to work on. Okay. Um, I'm just see that Councilor Diaz has her hand up as well. I'm going to let her um, hop in here to ask questions. I'm Good sorry. afternoon. It's, it's more of a, of a thank you. Thank you for the work that you've been doing here in the Cypress Hills East community. I have about 20 years or so of volunteering in one aspect or the other with the Department of Probation. Again, just thank you for your creativity, thinking outside the box and in, in engaging our community, which definitely whether it was a needed food or just making sure that they did what they were supposed to do and meet their commitment 
uh, agreed with the probation officers. My question is, is in reference to, to dads. I, I wanna know there's been a conversation and how do we help dads stay focused and, and develop as, as we would want them to develop? Is there a program in mind? Is there a conversation amongst you all? I, I like to help dads um, fulfill their role and responsibility in, in society. Um, so are we. We're definitely focused on that. We have, um, we've had over the years and continue to have fatherhood initiatives, um, you know, uh, out of our neons. It's part of our, you know, our one size fits one approach, right? So if somebody is a father, um, we try to make sure that we have all the bases covered, that there's enough contact, that there's the, you know, everything is, is okay in terms of the relationships uh, that need to be strong enough to allow for that for that relationship to develop um, and their growth as fathers is very important. So we use different programs, you know, a variety uh, uh, of them. I don't know if uh, DC Goodwin wants to chime in on this one since that's one of her areas. Uh, but yeah, it's something that 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 we're very focused on. Thank you. I, I, having worked at the shelter system, I have several I've dealt with several dads that were having a hard time engaging and then next steps. But I was also blessed in a happy place to have dads that custody of their children, even having been yeah. to the system. So I, I thank you for the work and the efforts that is happening to support dads. Thank you. DC Goodwin, do you wanna uh, mention a couple of? I, I think also one of the things we do do is also work with dads on child support. Wonderful. So we do have an aspect of um, probation that we do do that. And also in terms of what's to come, we're also looking into sustainability, economic sustainability, and we're looking into programming around that. So we're, we're, we're in the midst of uh, two gen generation and making sure that when they get off probation, they can move past and have what they need. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, we're gonna, just because we have such a long wait, we're gonna uh, go to the Board of Corrections. I wanna just say thanks to the department for your work. I know these are difficult times during COVID to be able to do working anywhere, including the work you're doing and recognize the challenges uh, in the past year and ahead. Um, but we look forward to our continued partnership and the council support of the programs you're doing like the Neons and um, Arches and other really important program. So uh, commissioner, I don't see power broker on your uh, bookshelf there, but we'll deduct one point. Uh, but uh, otherwise, nice to see you and thank you for all the work you're doing. Likewise, thank you. All right, thanks guys. We'll head over to the, now to the Board of Corrections. Okay. I will now administer the oath to the members of the Board of Correction. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes. Meg Egan. Yes. Emily Turner. Emily not on. Um, Robert Cohen. Yes. Is Emily Turner on? Emily, they want you on. She should be here. Hello? Oh, there she is. Hi, Emily. I just administered the oath. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from Executive Director Egan. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Powers and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice. My name is Margaret Egan, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Board of Correction, the independent oversight agency for the city's correctional facilities. I'm joined today by board member, Dr. Robert Cohen and our acting deputy executive director, Emily Turner. Board chair, Jennifer Jones Austin is unable to join us today. She sends her apologies and her regards. 
and we are submitting written testimony on her behalf. The city charter outlines the board's broad mandates, including to establish local regulations, investigate any matter within the jurisdiction of the Department of Correction and evaluate the Department and Correctional Health Services performance. The board plays a vital role in shaping and maintaining a safe and fair jail system in New York City. This is a critical moment for jail oversight and reform in New York. Front end justice reforms across the country are reducing rates of incarceration, yet the needs of those who remain incarcerated are more acute and demand greater vigilance over a system of services, safety, and care in the jails. As jails are reformed to become smaller, safer, and fairer, jail oversight becomes more essential. Today, New York City's justice system and jails are undergoing significant reform and facing equally significant challenges. With plans to replace Rikers Island with a system of small and more humane community-based jails underway, the jail system continues to face the COVID-19 pandemic. And despite long-term reductions, the jail population has been steadily e increasing, surpassing pre-pandemic levels. The Board of Correction must play a critical role in responding to and overcoming current challenges and realizing these reforms. The board's broad mandate to regulate the jail system provides an opportunity to set important policy reforms and, the primary, and as the primary oversight body for the jail system, the board must provide public, the public and the council with essential, independent and relative, relevant information to drive policy change. In this moment, when the board's work is more important than ever, we are also facing serious budget challenges. The fiscal year 2020, 2022 January financial plan sets the board's budget at approximately 2.4 million, which is a de decrease from 3.2 million prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. This plan also reduces our total headcount from 34 to 26, total funded headcount from 34 to 26, which represents a nearly 24% cut in our funded headcount since the 2020 fiscal year. For an agency as small as the board, this will present serious challenges in meeting our charter and legislative mandates. We understand that the city is facing a deep and very real fiscal crisis and many agencies are facing similar challenges. And we're encouraged by recent conversations with the Office of Management and Budget, including a commitment to fund staff to conduct death investigations. And we're working closely with OMB to restore funding for those additional positions. As it stands, the board's budget represents just 0.02% of the budgets of the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services. Fully restoring our funding and headcount to 34 positions, which amounts to just $830,000, would bring us to 0.22% of DOC and CHS's combined funding and will allow us to more effectively meet our mandates. The pandemic and our budget have forced us to fundamentally change the way we conduct our work. We have restructured and reset priorities to focus on the most critical areas. Everyone with at this board has met this moment with professionalism, flexibility, and grace. And I'm deeply grateful for and proud of every single person at this agency and the work they've done. On March 9th, the board voted to propose a rule governing the department's use of restrictive housing. This rule represents a significant step forward in rethinking how the department manages, dis manages discipline and violence. Chief among these reforms is the ending of punitive segregation or solitary confinement. This rule will also end the use of restraint desks and other non-individualized forms of restraint. Punitive segregation has proven over and over to be an inhumane practice resulting in debilitating trauma that endures, often for the remainder of a person's lifetime. It has also been shown to not be an effective tool for reducing violence in correctional facilities. The board's proposed rule and solitary confinement and replaces it with a more humane disciplinary model that focuses on safety for both staff and detained persons, mental health, effective and robust programming and education, and investment in training and the well being of employees. The rule also eliminates the use of intake areas for de escalation confinement, regulates the use of emergency lock ins, and sets robust reporting requirements to allow the board and the public to monitor the department's fidelity to this rule. The board's oversight and public reporting will be essential to ensure transparency and compliance. 
Our ability to independently assess and publicly report on the department's fidelity to the rule will be essential to providing transparency for the people in the model, both people in custody and staff. Like all others, the board was forced to quickly adapt to the new normal in response to the COVID-19 health crisis. Since the pandemic hit New York a year ago, the board has redirected its oversight. We reset our priorities to monitor both the department and CHS's evolving response and facility compliance with agency plans, as well as DOC and CHS's general operations and compliance with DOC minimum standards. From the beginning, our work has sought to independently and publicly document the scope of the public health crisis in the jails and the criminal justice system's response to understand successes and challenges and ultimately ensure that lessons can be learned quickly. We applaud the work of the department and CHS to mitigate the spread of the virus. The board quickly began producing daily public reports outlining DOC and CHS's response to the pandemic and continue to do so. These now weekly updates available on our website include data on the number of people in custody with active infections and those who have ever been infected, DOC staff who have been confirmed, CHS staff who have been confirmed, and the number of people who have passed away in custody. We also include a full analysis of the jail population to show custody status as well as certain demographic information. In the fall, as the jail population started to increase, we began producing a housing area density analysis in order to understand the ability of people to maintain social distancing in the housing areas. We believe these, that these updates are critical to provide the public, the court system, advocates, policymakers, and families with critical information on what is happening in the jails. In addition to these data reports, the board has developed a new crisis responsive jail monitoring approach. Giving, given our very small staff, our approach has largely focused on leveraging the board's access to data systems, surveillance cameras, grievance systems. All right, hang on one second, I just lost my connection. <laughs> Apologies. This is the joy of, of remote work. Um, sorry. Um, the board resumed targeted um, strategic in-jail inspections in mid-May and have been touring the jails regularly since. Leveraging these tools, the board has released several reports on our observations of social distancing, use of PPE among staff, use of masks among people in custody, phone access and cleaning and rounding practices. On March 9th, we released a new report analyzing the grievances received by the department during the COVID crisis. Finally, every day, the board receives complaints directly from people in custody, staff, family members, defense counsel, and advocates via phone, email, mail, and web form, just as we did before the crisis. Phone calls from the jail to the board are free and not monitored. Board staff developed a new complaint protocol to receive these complaints and refer them to the appropriate agency for response. The board also reviews to identify systemic and urgent issues which are escalated to DOC and CHS as appropriate. Additionally, the board has requested DOC and CHS provide updates on their evolving COVID response during, at our public meetings, which has happened each, each month since last March. Together, we believe this regular reporting provides all stakeholders with an accurate view of the jails in this moment. The board's oversight work has been and will continue to be critically important to assess this crisis response. We have and will continue to provide necessary information to the public outlining essential data and independently confirming what is actually happening in the jails while ensuring in-person visits and other suspended mandated services are restored as soon as it is safe to do so. We will continue to advocate for as small a jail system as is safely possible. And we will continue to advocate for everyone in the jails to receive the vaccine as soon as is humanly possible. Turning now to the task force on issues faced by transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary and or intersex people in custody. The board first convened the task force as mandated under local law 145 in October of 20. 2019. Since then, the board has coordinated 20 members and five 
subcommittees and is now diligently working to finalize the task, for, task force's first annual report. We believe the work of this task force is critical to ensuring the department and CHS's policies, procedures, and ultimately the conditions in the jails meet the need of, needs of the transgender community. We've requested funding for a position to support this work. Council recommended the city fund this position and we are working with OMB to ensure appropriate funding is secured. Now turning to death investigations. Um, recently, the OMB has committed to immediately restoring fund, to restore funding in order for the board to hire a person dedicated to conduct death investigations, as well as a second position to support that work. This critical funding will allow the board to review deaths in custody to identify systemic reforms to improve conditions and care and prevent future deaths. The board will also immediately move to conduct an independent audit of the mental observation units in the jails to review DOC and CHS policies, procedures, and outcomes. This, outcome, this audit will be conducted with additional financial support and will have the cooperation of both DOC and CHS. The audit will culminate in a public report outlining findings and making recommendations for, for reforms to improve care and reduce instances of self-harm and suicide. The elimination of these eight positions and the lack of funding for positions to support new work limits our ability to do this critical work and meet our council mandates. The board has been unable to monitor and publicly report on the transition to the new borough-based jail system as required by the council. The board plays an essential role in, the monitoring, in monitoring the department's current work and the plans for the new jails ensure, to ensure the conditions on Rikers are not simply relocated to new jails. We've also lost several research positions, which has limited our ability to continue comprehensively monitoring the standards on the elimination of sexual abuse and sexual harassment or PREA, the minimum standards required by PREA. The board has also been unable to assess DOC's compliance with reporting provisions, conduct annual report, annual audits of DOC, closing memos on investigations of sexual abuse and harassment allegations, annualize sexual abuse and harassment allegations or closely monitor the housing decisions for transgender individuals in custody. The research director of health and mental health position has also been eliminated, which impacts our ability to conduct an independent review and analysis of injuries and self-harm occurring in custody. We are also unable to produce the annual access to care report or monitor implementation of the board's prior recommendations for improving access to health and mental health care in the jail. The recent commitment to support an independent audit of the mental observation units is encouraging. However, our long-term oversight and reporting will require restoration of this position. Additionally, our research and policy associate positions were eliminated, which prevents the board from producing public reports on lockdowns, slashings, jail violence, and people who spend extended time in punitive segregation. Finally, we have also been unable to make the appropriate investments in our IT infrastructure necessary to keep pace with DOC's IT changes and ensure BOC systems are supported in the long term. We're encouraged by our recent discussions with OMB to restore the board's funding and headcount. Moreover, in order to set the board on a course to fully meet this moment of opportunity, we've raised short-term private funds and are beginning a comprehensive strategic planning process. Over the next four months, the board will conduct a planning process to coalesce around a new vision for jail oversight, strengthen the organization and its practices to more effectively and efficiently conduct our work and continue to position ourselves as a model for jurisdictions across the country that are seeking a more humane, accountable and safe use of jail. The Board of Correction is essential to the success of the reforms that the city council and the administration seeks to realize. Without the appropriate funding, the board will struggle to meet these shared goals, our charter mandate, or our legislative mandates. It is essential that the funding for critical positions be restored so we are able to, be, to meet both our mandate and our promise. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you for that testimony. And um, a few questions. Um, we're here, I'm glad to hear about the OMB's commitment to fund staff to con conduct um, death investigations. Can you just walk us through right now what your role is in that, if any, and what resources do you think you need to conduct them? 
Uh, obviously, there, we'll go into more detail, but there have been two deaths in recent weeks. And want to know if you're involved in any of those investigations right now and uh, what resources do you think you need moving forward? Yeah, so um, so we we have the authority to to investigate all deaths in custody, um, and and there is a essentially a subcommittee of the board, the Prison Death Review Board, um, that's chaired by Jackie Sherman, and and so we we conduct investigations. Um, we, we're trying to conduct investigations into all deaths in custody, um, but but as I said, you know, resources are a serious challenge. Um, a death investigator will certainly help, and and support staff will help. Um, but we our our goal is to do a thorough review of all of these cases to identify the the systemic issues and and reforms that need to take place to prevent any any future deaths. Um, so you know the commitment from OMB is helpful, um, but you know these tend to be compl complex cases, and so additional um, um, support staff would would also be incredibly helpful. Are you involved uh, in the, sorry, are you involved, you are involved in investigations of the recent deaths? Yeah, so yes. So while, you know, we, again, we have, we have jurisdiction over the deaths that occur in custody. Um, one of the cases, the, the person, my understanding is the person was released just before he passed away. Um, so we still have jurisdiction over, over, you know, what happened in the jails, but it's not, it wouldn't be necessarily a formal death investigation. Okay. And one of the deaths was an apparent suicide. Are, are you aware of whether the individual in question was receiving any mental health services? Um, we're, so we're doing a preliminary, we do a preliminary investigation um, for the board quickly after each, um, each death. Um, and so we're still gathering that information. Um, but, but as I said, we, um, we're gonna turn to an audit of the, of the mental observation units to understand um, both DOC and CHS's policies, procedures, practices, outcomes um, to identify reforms. We're, we are deeply concerned about incidents of self-harm and suicide in those units. And do you, do you believe that the department is doing enough right now to prevent or address uh, individuals that might be suicidal? Um, I, you know, I think that's, that's what this audit will, will turn up. I mean, there, there is clearly an issue that, that, needs, to be, that needs to be addressed. Um, but in terms of specifics, I don't have specifics at the moment. Okay, and it, does, that, does that mean that you, if you get the funding, will do a little more of a broader audit than individual one-off cases to look at policy and protocol around deaths? Yes, yeah, I, I see them working in concert. So, so you know, a, a, the, the, the plan is, is for the audit to look at the units as a whole and the, the way that both DOC and CHS are operating them, but, but on a parallel track, um, conduct these death investigations to look into these specific cases so we can identify additional um, systemic reforms. Okay. And um, do you know how many deaths occurred in DOC custody in 2020? Um, Emily, do we have a current number? If not, we can get back to you. Emily, you're muted. Um, I believe there were six. Six. And those were COVID related or were they... Uh, um, three of which um, have been confirmed to be COVID related. Okay, and what is the status of the other three? Um, the other three um, had other medical um, conditions. Uh, one was a suicide, one we still don't have the autopsy report for, and the other um, I'm sorry, there were seven, sorry, seven, seven, three COVID related, one um, related to um, three related to, two related to other medical conditions, 
one still unknown because we don't have the autopsy and one was a suicide. Okay. And you'll be, the board is doing a review of all those or they have, or they have something, some sort of ongoing? We, we do preliminary review of every death, um, but um, not a comprehensive, comprehensive report and um, of every. Okay. Um, we had raised this issue. I, I think this was even in the council's budget response a few years ago about you know, do you, the, the board's budget relative to the department's budget, and uh, particularly if you look at like the civilian complaint review board, I believe their budget's now set at 1% of the NYPD's personnel budget. And we see the board as a critical uh, stakeholder in holding the department accountable, also doing investigations in these instances we're talking about. Um, can you talk to us just about your budget reduction this year, understanding that we, we you know, I think I, I and others feel like you're already underfunded uh, relative to the, the DOC's budget. Can, can you tell us a bit about what services will be cut as a result of or you know, last year's budget reduction, what got cut and now this year, what you believe you know, where, where the cuts are gonna occur if there's a further budget reduction? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the, the budget has been reduced from about 3.2 million um, at this time last year to about 2.6 and, and our funded headcount has gone from 34 to, um, to 26. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of that are, have been open positions that we haven't been able to fill. So, um, so I talked about the director of, of medical and mental health research. I talked about um, the, the director, the PREA research director um, we, we lost one of our in-jail monitors. Um, so all of that together means that we, you know, we are, we end up being a very small team that can focus on only a few priorities. So over the course of the last year, we've had to shift everything to focus certainly on COVID, um, and also the development of this, of this rule. Um, and so all, I would say the vast majority of, of our, of our work has been focused in those two areas. Um, and it means that we just can't focus on the other critical areas, Priya being one example, um, you know, of, of, um, of oversight in this jail system. The jail system is a, is a large and complicated jail system and our oversight is essential for the public to understand what is actually happening in, the, in those facilities. And, um, and the more our budget is cut, the less we are able to conduct the oversight, conduct the, the analysis that we need and, and report out to, um, to the council and, and to the public. Um, so, so these, these cuts end up being devastating for an agency as small as ours. Okay. I'm going to add just one more question and I'm going to hand over. I see two colleagues, I think two colleagues have questions. Um, how, how much private funding has a board received and can you tell us what it's used for? Yeah. So we, we receive, we've received about $150,000, um, specifically to fund our strategic planning work, um, you know, we, we had planned when, when I joined the board about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, I had planned on, on doing some strategic planning work and, um, and we lost the funding. And so we turned to um, philanthropy to, to support that. Um, and so, so we're grateful for that. Um, but, you know, it, it's, I don't think the way that, that the board as a, as a city agency needs to be, should be funded. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to, I think we have Councilor Holden and Councilor Rosenthal, I believe, in that order. Um, so we'll kind of take, let them ask questions. Then. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just quickly, there's, uh, you, I don't know if you heard um, some of my questions uh, to the Department of Corrections about the 1,000, almost 1,000 correction officers re resigning, not retiring, resigning um, uh, in the past two years. Did, 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 have you weighed in on that or, you know, as a reason, uh, looked into why so many are resigning or 
even like the, you can weigh in on uh, the has the board weighed in on the triple shifts that was mentioned uh, today and has been mentioned for a while. Um, so we're deeply concerned about the triple shifts. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's you know it's it's inhumane for for the staff, um, and you know people should should be able to receive their their meal breaks and and um, and not you know not be forced to work into a, a triple tour. Um, you know. We understand that the staffing, there are staffing issues across the city, um, but but there is a we think there is a the, a way to to manage so that people are not working into triple tours. It's it's um, it's dangerous. Um, we have not had the the capacity to look into these staffing issues, um, but but we remain um we remain incredibly concerned uh, um just just go, going back to the triple shift has there been any studies of the effectiveness of, a, of an officer who's working triple shifts i mean medically or historically what could happen in, inside the jail i mean it's common sense that we know that the longer you work the less sharp you are but has there been any studies nationwide about this or you know why isn't it just against the law to have more than double shifts. Why don't we have legislation already in, in place about that? Off the top of my head, I'm not I'm I'm not aware of any studies, but we can look into it and get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Next we'll go to Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you. Council member, you went back on mute. Wait, you're back on mute again. I keep hitting unmute. Oh, there we go. There you go. Okay, you're good. Let's take that one. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I don't quite know how to ask the question because it just sounds like you're so completely underfunded. You know, it's hard to even know where to start, but um, could you, is a way to, to quantify it that, you know, uh, that you're underfunded to do your mandated work by a certain number of people? So for example, on the TGNC advisory, task advisory council, I'm pretty sure that written into the law was one FTE, unless I'm wrong. And so how, how much stuff like that do you, do you think is going on? How many people are you short? Yeah, so, um, so I don't believe, although I will double check that, that the funding for the position to support the task force was actually written into the bill, but I know that the city council has expressed support for funding that position. Um, Emily, certainly correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and and you know we're working with OMB to to receive that funding. Um, another example is is the the council's mandate um, to um, monitor the the transition to the borough based jails. Um, we we haven't been funded um, to we haven't received a position to support that work. Um, you know, we, I, if, if we restored our funding to, to fund the 34 positions um, that we had a year ago, um, it would, it would certainly go a long way, but we would still be a very small staff. Um, yeah. Again, we would still be just 0.22% of of the the agency budgets that we are um, mandated to oversee. Um, and so you know, I, I think that we, the staff has done an incredible job of, of stepping up and doing as much as we possibly can. And as I said in my testimony, I'm very proud of, of the work that we've done over the course of the last year. Um, but I think we can do a lot more. Um, and I think we can do a lot more in these critical areas, again, around medical and mental health. 
um, around yeah. PREA, the task force, like all of all of these sort of issue areas, we certainly could use more um, more funding to support people um, to to do that work. Okay, great. Sorry, someone's putting a sheet of paper, and I actually am interested in in what she's put up. So apologies. Um, I guess the question is: Over the last year, how many rape cases uh, have you investigated? And is that by the NYPD? Yes, or NYPD and DOC? So let's assume it's NYPD and DOC. So um, Emily, I'll, I will ask for you to, to jump in here. I So DOC actually conducts the investigations um, and then we oversee that, that process. Um, I don't have a number off the top of my head. Um, Emily, do we have something? I don't have the um, the uh, total number of allegations um, in front of me, but uh, we as the board do not conduct those investigations. What we um, had been doing when we did have a PREA director was um, we were able to conduct audits of the closing memos of DOC. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, and we were able to look at the quality of the DOC investigations, make recommendations, and more um, consistently review um, what was happening in those investigations. We were also able to independently um, review the data that's reported um, that was required under our 540 reports under PREA standards um, about um, allegations of sexual abuse and um, sexual harassment in custody. Um, and that is something that we have not been able to update. Um, yeah. And we have not been able to continue that work um, because we have lost staff. Um, and, you know, we continue to track um, what they are reporting to us, but we have not been able to dig into it in the same way that we had been previously. Yeah, that's like remarkable because I remember I'm going glad. down this wormhole with um, with DOC when we had a PREA hearing and just sort of the numbers were outrageous for the number of, um, you know, cases investigated. It was tiny and the number, how long it took, which was ridiculously long. Um, and, and the fact that in the one case they actually did investigate and find that it was true um, that they allowed that DOC officer to resign. So, so it's frustrating to me to hear um, what you're, what you're um, saying. Huh. Um, and it gets, it gets complicated between which cases DOC investigates versus DOI versus um, the DAs. And so it, it gets very complicated and to stay on top of that, um, and make sure there's accountability throughout the process um, is something that we would like to be able to monitor more closely, but we um, understand at times have not had the capacity to, to do that level of um, oversight. One last question, Chair Powers, if that's okay with you. I'm gonna take that as a yes. And um, can I just ask, um, would it require state law to make it so um, BOC investigate all of those pre accusations versus anything that's internal to DOC? Um. That's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. I, I mean, I right again. Right now, our oversight is over the the investigation process, right? Rather than terrible. Um, they're criminal matters, so I don't. We we definitely don't have the authority to investigate criminal matters. So that that's currently outside of our jurisdiction. So I think there would need to be a change, um, and. I think that is something that I can definitely say for sure we do not have the capacity to do as a board right of now. Of course, of course. Um, right. So in your conversations, thank you for all of that. So in your conversations with OMB, uh, 
So obviously you had conversations with them prior to the release of the preliminary budget. And, and so we see what they thought of, of your request, which was not to fund anything in additional. So what's changed? Uh, is, has anything changed between then and now? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have continued to, to talk to them and, and to raise the, the very concerns that I am raising to, to all of you now. Um, and, um, you know, I, th I think that, that I'm sure the, the, the federal um, stimulus bill has changed the conversation somewhat. Um, um, and, you know, we continue to, to press the case that, that our oversight responsibility and mandate is essential to achieving the goals that you know we have all um Great. set out and and so I, I i think that is that is part of what is is changing the conversation as well yeah i think that your idea about the stimulus is you know the the door opening a crack and it would strike me that now's the time to jump on that because I'm confident that now is when they're determining how to allocate it. Um, so that's my two cents. And thank you for everything you do. I so admire your work. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Jeff Powers. Thank you, Council Member. Um, just in respect to time, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take it from there uh, and then our questions there. But thank you to the board. We definitely know how much uh, work you have ahead of you, how much how important you guys are to this whole uh, criminal justice system here in New York City and certainly wanna make sure that you are funded to be able to do the work that you are mandated to do here in the city. So thank you. And we will uh, look forward to continue to work with you through the adoption of the budget to get you properly funded. Great, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, do you guys wanna call up the next, uh, next individual panel? Yes, we will now turn to testimony from members of the public. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one and we'll also announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. I would like to now welcome uh, Benny Bastio to testify followed by Lauren Crotolo and then Zachary Katz Nelson. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairman Powers and the distinguished members of your committee. My name is Benny Basio Jr. and I am the president of the Correction Officers Benevolent Association, the second largest law enforcement union in the city of New York. Our members, as you know, provide care, custody, and control of over 5,700 inmates daily. Today's hearing focuses on a discussion concerning the Department of Corrections budgetary needs for fiscal year 2022, as well as the mayor's preliminary management report for 2021. With the limited time I have, I want to address both of these critical issues as they each reflect the dire working conditions of the brave men and women, um, the brave and dedicated correction officers working in the city's jails. Let's start with the mayor's preliminary management report for 2021 which was posted very quietly to the city's website just recently. The report revealed that last year, there was a 23% increase in inmate assaults on correction officers and 123 inmate slashings and stabbings compared to the 106 inmate slashings and stabbings from the previous year. The report further revealed that within the inmate population, the, num the number of incarcerated individuals held on violent felony charges increased by 23%. This comes as no surprise to us as nearly every week we visit correction officers who are being treated at a hospital for the injuries they sustained from an inmate assault or stabbing or splashing. This committee has heard our cries for help every time we come before you and every time we testify before you, we highlight the horrible conditions our officers are subjected to, yet our concerns continue to fall on deaf ears. You want us to perform our dangerous jobs with perfection yet you refuse to give us the necessary support and the resources we need to do it. We need action and we need it now. In fact, we need the same willingness to help our officers as the willingness you demonstrate to help the inmates. Despite the soaring levels of jail violence, 
Most of you support the mayor's plan to end punitive segregation entirely, which he recently announced. Now is not the time to remove the one tool we have to maintain safety and security. My members deserve better. They deserve to go home the same way they left. Instead, your main concern is that the same inmates who brutalize my members and nonviolent inmates are given pizza parties, tablets, and Game Boys. The New York City Department of Corrections treatment of its workforce is a national disgrace. And those of you who continue to look the other way are complicit. Another disgraceful practice committed by the Department of Correction has been the department's policy of forcing correction officers to work triple and sometimes even quadruple consecutive shifts, missing meals, missing sleep, and jeopardizing their health during a pandemic. This crisis first emerged last year at the height of COVID-19 pandemic when 1,400 of my officers contracted this deadly disease. As the at, at the time, the mayor called this a dumb managerial mistake and he vowed this would never happen again. Well, here we are a year later and I have officers working, in, going into triple shifts just about every day. I have officers sleeping in their cars at Rikers because they are so exhausted. They're afraid they'll drive off the road. I have officers getting hotel rooms near Rikers. I have officers, many of whom are single mothers, literally crying they, when they go home to their families because of the stress and disruption this inhumane practice has caused. Just this past weekend at the Anna M. Cross Center alone, we had 58 correction officers go into a triple tour and approximately 30 of them worked 24 hours straight or more. This directly contradicts the department's claim that triple tours only happen when there is a weather emergency and that only work and that they only work a couple of hours into a triple tour on average. We need more correction officers and we need them now. The city has not hired a class of correction officers in over two years, yet a new class of over 800 police officers were recently hired. The inmate population is back up significantly to 5,700, and yet we have lost about 1,700 officers over the past two years, mostly due to resignations because our working conditions are so unbearable. And since this past September, over 300 of our officers have contracted COVID. In order to finally end triple tours, the city needs to hire at least 2,000 correction officers and the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2022 should allocate the necessary resources to make that goal a reality. With that said, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Just a few questions. We, we, you know, a few of us had mentioned this issue earlier on the staffing issue, which is absolutely shameful. We are on the record, met a number of us to the department about the treatment of your staff, uh, of your of your members, rather. Can you tell us what the agency is telling you right now? We have heard, as you mentioned, uh, uh, issues around that are or excuses, I suppose, around weather conditions and short overrun into the third shift and things like that. Yet I've also heard even this past weekend, folks still working up to seven hours into the next shift. What is the department telling your members and your and you right now when it comes to why triple shifts are still being, are still happening despite their um, claim to end them or their attempt to end them? Well, look, what, what they're doing is obviously not working, all right? We need correction officers and the department um, has neglected the fact in the city of New York to hire correction officers to keep up with attrition. Everybody thought that the MA population were gonna drop down to 3,500 and as we see it's 5,700 and rising. So, you know, we need correction. They say there's a various amount of reasons as to why. A lot of the posts that are unbudgeted that don't show up on paper, um, is a main factor with all the inmate programs that we now have require us to have more correction officers. And when you look at us on paper, it looks like, yeah, we have two to one, but not every correction officer is on you know, every shift. We rotate the 24 hour basis on all three shifts. So at any given time, all 80, 80 um, 8,000 correction officers are and aren't on, on tour. Um, and, and the, um... Uh, what, what is the agency, but I just want to hear, but what is the agency telling you for the, the reasons why this has to happen? They testified earlier to us, they've put stuff in writing, but what, what are they telling your members in terms of both um, why they have to work three shifts? And also in instances where an individual is staying at a hotel 
or something like that, I assume, but I want to just hear you confirm it, that those individuals are paying out of pocket for that? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're saying that they had anticipated closing facilities and that they weren't able to do it. And the COVID situation, I, I mean, they've told me everything that they told you today at this hearing. But the reality is that we're suffering. And this, and we come to this council on numerous bases telling you guys what the problems are. But even as I sit here today, I see most of the questions are geared towards the inmates, the well-being of inmates. And I applaud um, Council Member Adams and Holden and yourself to an extent um, on shedding light on, on what it is that we're dealing with. But the reality is that everybody's main focus is the inmates. And we are part of this equation and we provide public safety to this city. We're essential workers and you guys treat us as if we don't count for anything. And that's a tragedy. That's a disgrace of how we're treated and we can't get the help that we need from you, our elected officials. And guess what? We're your constituents also. And we will be heavy at the polls voting on those that help us and we will remember those that are not helping us. And our members will know and their family members will know as well because we need your help. Okay, um, thank you for that. The, um, the, can you just tell us about testing and vaccines right now? What is your access for your members to testing? And what is your access to that? You are eligible of course for vaccines, but what is the agency or what is the city doing or can you tell us about access to testing and vaccines in the middle of the pandemic, early in the pandemic, we had raised an issue to them, to the agency, myself and other members of this committee around uh, lack of access to testing. And uh, what is the ability for your members right now to access uh, it, 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 uh, on site at the facilities or in general access to test and, and also I guess, of course, PPE as well. We have access to testing and um, getting the vaccine on Rikers um, every day. Our members do have access. I will give the mayor um, credit for that. We, we do have access to the vaccines on the island. On the island, okay. Do you know how many of your members have taken advantage of that? Uh, maybe close to a prime. I'm giving the approximate numbers, maybe 2,000. Okay, I've taken advantage of the vaccine on, on the at, at, at work site. Okay. Um, and uh, I will, I, let me just see if, either, if there's like a few members here, if they have any questions. I, I know Councilman Rosenthal is here, but her function is not working. Um, I, I, I just want to say, I mean, I, I don't want to make this into an, I don't think we need to get an argument here, but I, I do think some of the issues we are raising here today about access to privacy to phone calls, to uh, issues around uh, folks being mistakenly released, things like that, and deaths in the jail is not putting your, it's not an either or situation. I mean, I, we are, there are issues that are raised that I think are very grave and serious issues. And I think alongside those include the safety of your members as well. And members have raised that as well in terms of the, the working conditions. Um, I don't think advocating for the safety of individuals in custody is puts you, your members at risk either in the, particularly in the conditions we're talking about today with its privacy to uh, conversations on council. And so I just want to, I want to add that in because I, I think we do, we do obviously care about making sure your members are safe when they go in, whether it's from COVID or from violence. And uh, it's a responsibility to look at that issue amongst others as well. Um, with that being said, I can go to council, see if there's any members who have questions right now. And we have no issue with that councilman powers. We have no issue. We want everybody to be safe. And inmates are not being provided the services that they need because we're on the staff. And guess what happens? They take out their aggression on us because they're not getting what they're supposed to be getting in accordance with minimum standards. So yeah, that's part of this equation. And yes, we do care about inmates. You know, contrary to what people think that we're in, in jail abusing inmates. That is not happening. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to council member questions. Okay, am I just starting? <laughs> All right. Um, hi, thanks for coming here. Um, I, I want to run something by you that that the DOC commissioner said, and I wonder what what you think of this. 
When I asked about um, the Rosem Singer Center being at only 20% capacity and asking if they could, um, you know, change around where people are in order to, um, this was actually in reference to capital, not, a, not expense. But they, they seemed to indicate there was no way that every, every building had to stay open. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, Councilmember Rosenthal, um, we, have to, we have different categories of inmates that can't co-mingle in some cases. So inmates do have to be spread out. Um, the, the, the department isn't even abiding by CDC guidelines when it comes to social distancing due to COVID. So you know, when you talk about the amount of inmates on Rosie's, we need, you know, we have the real estate to spread out the population, but you're more concerned about closing jails. So if, if, if the council's seriously um, interested in keeping us safe and the inmates safe, then we should have less inmates in each housing area and spread out the population and hire more correction officers. Sounds to me like they've already done it at Rosie's. That, that's what they seem to be saying that they've spread out the population, yes. In three and females yeah. could only be in one facility. Okay, I'm a little, so I'm not expert at this. Council Member Powers, I'm sure you could thread this much better than me. But, you know, when I asked DOC about why, you know, if the, if, if, if Rosie's is only 20% full, why couldn't they move everyone to like a similar location? Their answer was, well, no, everyone, just like you said, everyone needs to be in their own area. So young adults in one area, maternity in one area, um, you know, stuff like that. And so they were saying that they are very spread out and already, but, and I'm only asking about Rosie's because I really don't know about the general pop, you know? So um, I just, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, Rosie's is part of the general pop. Like I said, you have different categories of inmates, but that's the facility that houses females. But I mean, you talking about spreading out the, any concerns about officers working triple tours? Do, do you b believe that it's it's not inhumane that officers should work three consecutive tours without being afforded a meal break? I have um, officers that are diabetics. They, they can't get their medication because they're not being relieved off post. You have, you have anything to add on that, Council Member Rosenthal? Uh, no, that, uh, that wasn't my line of questioning, but what you're describing, of course, sounds terrible. I'm with you there. Uh, I think I'm done. Uh, Chair Powers, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll go to any other council members that they have their hands up. Okay, thank you. Call to the next panel. Thank you, appreciate the time. I would like to now welcome Lauren Crotolo to testify, followed by Zachary Katznelson and then Mary Lynn Wurlwas. Time you. starts now. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Powers and committee members. My name is Lauren Curatolo. I'm the director of Midtown Community Court, and I'm thrilled to be here to represent the Center for Court Innovation. During 2021, the Center's Innovative Criminal Justice Award was cut in half. This, of course, was unfortunate because this funding permits us to respond to the immediate needs we see in our communities, pilot new ideas, and evaluate them. Based on our 2021 award amount and because of the ways in which the pandemic exacerbated issues around housing, mental health, and domestic violence specifically, we focused our efforts to address those major concerns. One example of a pilot we're working on now in partnership with Midtown North Precinct and the NYPD's Behavioral Health Unit, as well as Fountain House, is called the Rapid Engagement Initiative. And this initiative offers individualized, voluntary, and rapid care, including mental health, harm reduction, and many other services to people arrested on cases that are desk appearance ticket eligible on the same day of a person's arrest. However, because of budgetary cuts, we had to make some hard choices also. And among them were reductions for support for anti-gun violence programming, child trauma support, 
support, DWI screenings and assessments, among others. So we ask council to please support a return to the budget awarded to the center in fiscal year 20 or to increase that amount so that we may be able to continue to provide the necessary supports our communities so desperately need, especially now. And on a final note, I turn your attention to a pilot reentry project for which the center is seeking funding called the Family Healing Project, which uses restorative practices to offer sustained logistical and emotional support during the first year of a person's release from prison. This support would include those individuals' families. By strengthening that, that person's connections and supports, this initiative aims to decrease rates of homelessness and technical parole violations and offer meaningful support and healing to the entire family. We thank you so much for your support and your time. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Uh, we're big fans of your organization and your work. So we certainly want to see you get the funding you need to do your work. Obviously tough fiscal situation, but hopefully a better situation this year. So thanks for all the work you're doing. Thank you and nice seeing you. You too. Thanks. I would like to now welcome Zachary Katz Nelson to testify, followed by Mary Lynn Wallace and then Gregory Williams. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Zachary Katz Nelson. I'm the policy director at the Lippman Commission. Thank you for the chance to testify. Uh, we all know we need better management and more accountability throughout the Department of Correction. Triple shifts are one piece of that. Uh, aside from this mismanagement and the fact that 1,200 officers are calling in sick every day, a really worrying number which deserves further examination, just, just reiterates that we have to close Rikers. The, the physical layout there demands staffing assignments that proper jails would not. We need to move into the borough facilities as soon as absolutely possible. But before then, we have to change how the jails operate and how they're funded. Uh, take, for instance, the emergency services unit, the riot squad, or the jails. They've been singled out time and again by the Nunez monitor for exacerbating violence because they respond far too often with far too many officers. But the proposed budget from the mayor funds them at the same inflated multi-million dollar level. Uh, we, we also believe that the civil service laws should be changed outside the budget to allow the DOC to hire wardens from outside the department. Having to hire solely from within has left us with far too thin a bench, and we're seeing the results of that. We also agree that the BOC's budget is far too small for the job we're asking of them. They're critical to efforts to remake this department as we move forward. Their budget, frankly, should be doubled or even tripled uh, compared to what it is now. It's really a pittance relative to the DOC. And then more broadly, we have to invest in the things that keep people out of Rikers in the first place. Programs that have been proven to drive down the violence that we're seeing that have been exacerbated during COVID, keep people out of the system in the first place, violence interruption, intervention, deep intervention with youth, community-based mental health care, supportive housing, things that are proven to work to drive down crime and violence far more cheaply, far more effectively than Rikers, which is itself proven to be criminogenic and begets more violence. So now is the time to really focus our efforts on those things, which COVID disrupted tremendously, leading to more violence. We can double down on those programs and really help our city overall. Thanks so much. Thank you. And, you know, as we've discussed, as the, you discussed, the staffing issues are horrendous and the violence issues are um, in desperate need of addressing. We'd like to work, you know, as much as we can with you guys to address those issues. And, with, you know, if you have ID recommendations on those programs, like that can help reduce the violence, we'll certainly, as we're doing the restrict, as a board is doing the restrictive housing roles, certainly we'll work with you to, um, on those ideas. So thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you. I would like to now welcome Mary Lynn Whirlwas to testify, followed by Gregory Williams and then Jennifer Parrish. Time starts now. Mary, it appears we cannot can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh, We hear you talking, but it looks like you're unmuted, but I think we're having an issue maybe with your microphone. Um, why don't we uh, move on and we'll come back once and see if we can get you sorted out. Um, but we do want to get back to you. Uh, let's uh, have to the next one and then perhaps we can come back. Yes. 
Um, Gregory Williams, followed by Jennifer Parrish, and then Darren Mack. Time starts now. I'm on mute. Yes. Uh, camera. Beautiful. All right. My name is Greg Williams. Good afternoon, Chair Powell, community members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Greg Williams, and I'm a member of Freedom Agenda and a fierce advocate for justice. Since 2019, I've been involved in the movement to close Riken. And unfortunately, due to punitive growth system, I've ended up stuck there for two months this past fall. Before I continue on, I would just like to say that these type of hearings, the only thing we hear is underfunded and or we're okay as we are. But what I wish to share today is just the opposite. These hearings are about money, money, and more money. But it's wasted money. Our position is simple that it's overstaffed. We heard about we heard about how the officers are working triple shifts. That's because it's being handed to them for special treatment. They're overworked, that's true, but it's only a selective few. So if we were to look and examine at who's getting this overtime, we would see that it's a handful of people because it's the issue at point is mismanagement. It's not, we need more money. It's not, there's not enough staff. That's absurd. It's, I've personally experienced staff just sitting around doing absolutely nothing or visiting their coworkers on their posts, hiding from actual work. I've seen officers sitting around playing dominoes and cards with other persons that are incarcerated. And when asked to give another officer a bathroom break, or hold their post down so they can eat their meal or whatever the case is, they refuse and look at them like they're crazy. They actually get upset with the other officer for asking for assistance. I've also personally- I'm expired. Excuse me? Uh, actually, bear with me, please. Yeah, I, uh, I've personally experienced how the officers are wasting time and energy. I've also heard how officers are subjected to abuse and mistreatment, but nobody bothers to mention the abuse and mistreatment that the officers inflict on the persons that are incarcerated that just may lead to this problem. So I urge you to really examine the administrative perspective of what's going on. And it's not always about give me more money or I'm fine with where I'm at. It's always about how things are conducted and handled. And I thank you very much for your time. And I wish this. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. Thank you. Next, we'll see if Mary Lynn can join us. We can hear her. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hear you. Okay. Thank you. Then uh, the rebooting was the magic. Always is. Turn on, turn on. Thank off. you. Um, as we've heard today, uh, the Department of Corrections inability to perform its duties has by now exacted an intolerable toll on this city. Uh, our recommendations for change at the Legal Aid Society are rooted in the Prisoner's Rights Project, nearly 50 years of advocacy in the jails, litigating areas like misuse of force, protection from suicide, uh, and preventing other needless deaths in custody through the council's budgetary support. And from this experience spanning the tenures of 23 commissioners, we conclude that the failures of this agency do not lie with a singular individual, although uniformed and civilian leaders do bear special responsibilities, but rather with a profound lack of accountability for misconduct and mismanagement across the entire department. This is an insular system, one that does not recognize its own failures and thus cannot reform itself. The debacle with the telephone calls is an example. Our first recommendation today is the department must cease recording all telephone calls from the jails immediately. The city should repeal the regulations permitting this practice and should not renew the contract with Securus. We reported these breaches at the Legal Aid Society to DOC in the spring and received assurances in the summer they were fixed. 
yet here we are. Second, the city can no longer rely almost exclusively on uniform leadership that came up through the ranks of this broken agency with its absurd thresholds for brutality and incompetence. We cannot expect line officers who join with the best intentions to embrace a new culture and new practices if their supervisors do not. We need to hire a new deep bench of wardens, deputy supervisors, whatever level of leadership it takes to bring a 21st century model to our jails. Lastly, independent right. oversight of the jails, if I could just finish this sentence, is essential. And we ask you to fully fund the Board of Correction, which our city charter vests with this authority and whose work is needed now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a few questions for you before I hand it over to the next uh, panelist. Um, just on the phone calls issue, which I have to say was a fairly infuriating uh, few hours here at the council um, be, to find out in the middle of all this that groups like the Legal Aid Society have been raising this issue since the beginning of the pandemic. Can you share with us when the Legal Aid Society had first approached the department with this issue and what the response was? Yes, absolutely. In a meeting with the Department of Correction on May 29th, 2020, the senior leadership from the Legal Aid Society and the Department of Correction, we raised this issue and made a very clear list of requests for auditing and for looking into this question. This was, as is now well known, it came to our attention through discovery in criminal cases. Uh, this was followed up by on June 17th, 2020, by a letter from Legal Aid's general counsel to uh, June 17th, 2020, uh, by letter from uh, the general counsel of the Legal Aid Society regarding our concerns over this repeated practice. And again, uh, seeking answers as to how it happened the scope of the breach and uh, assurances it wouldn't happen again. On September 10th, 2020, we received assurances from the department that the problem had been fixed and would not recur again. And yet here we are today. Our deepest concern and with what, what with and what leads us to today, in addition to with all of the defenders seeking a full audit of what happened is the reactive model to this problem of treating each of these requests as a sign, as, as a one-off was I believe the word that was used rather than taking it as a, where there's smoke, there may be fire and investigating for the systemic problem that went wrong. That didn't happen when it should have in the spring, and this is where we are today. Yeah, and I was in receipt of a earlier correspondence, I think, in May, that was from the legal. So I think there was one other correspondence that went over in earlier May that maybe led to the meeting. And mm -hmm. um, can you describe that correspondence? It. Um, I'm not sure what. It, which I, I will say, I am not sure. Which, I'm not privy to all of them or haven't of the correspondences that we had. Um, this was from at the levels that I know we're speaking, uh, which is in May, um, that we're speaking to the department about these problems. They had certainly been brought up and we were extensively trying to navigate with the department uh, throughout all of the spring to ensure that numbers were in fact uh, on a do not record list. And secondly, that that meant something. It is not just the question of were they on the list, but whether or not they were being recorded. Right, and right. it has caused massive confusion among an extremely professional staff that, that talked to incarcerated people daily in trying to navigate what calls were being recorded, what did the warnings mean or not mean. And frankly, the answers were unsatisfactory. And, and one last question, so, so we have a long list here, but what happens with a case or a client where this has been illegally handed over to them, or maybe I'll say wrongfully handed over to them, 
um, and uh, the, the district attorney has now access to phone calls they were not supposed to have, could have had private information in it or things affecting the case. What is the, what happens in that instance to the case or to the individual? Well, in, in an even broader number of individuals, even if that recorded phone call never was handed over to the district attorney, there has been a breach of attorney-client confidentiality. Our clients uh, are, for good reason, uh, concerned if any breaches of that privilege occur. The department recording it is a breach of that uh, attorney-client privilege in and of itself, regardless of even if it got to the district attorney. But by getting to the district attorney and the effect on the criminal case and whether uh, it so taints that criminal case is exactly what we're going to be needing to untangle here of just in just how many cases uh, did this affect? And the answer seems to be an extraordinary number, uh, perhaps an unprecedented number of criminal cases in the city that are affected by this. And that mean that individuals did not get their constitutional right to counsel. Right, it's on, on somewhat outrageous. I wouldn't even say somewhat, it's outrageous. It, it, it's outrageous. Yeah, thank you for that. I wanna make sure we get to other folks as well, but we'll uh, thank you for your work on this and bringing some of these to light. It is nothing short of outrageous, as I said, and, and somewhat baffling. Um, so thank you for that. And we'll, we'll be in touch. Thanks so much uh, we'll to the next panelist. I would like to now welcome Jennifer Parrish to testify, followed by Darren Mack and then Brandon Holmes. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Parrish and I'm the Director of Criminal Justice Advocacy at the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project. We represent the Brad H class, which includes everyone who receives mental health treatment in the city jails. Now that's about 53% of the jail population. The Department of Correction is not capable of providing an atmosphere that addresses the need of people with mental health concerns. The jail environment is chaotic, abusive, and punitive. Time spent in these conditions is likely to re-traumatize those subjected to it. The city and this council must do everything possible to decarcerate and provide community support so that people with mental health needs are not subjected to these conditions. For as long as the Department of Correction continues to operate city jails, the Board of Correction is essential to provide some amount of transparency and oversight. The Board cannot carry out this critical function without adequate funding. The Board needs to have staff inside the jails to observe conditions, investigate incidents, and resolve complaints. In addition, the Board must have funding needed to hire researchers and other staff to report publicly on what's happening within the jails. The Board's monitoring and reporting are essential for the Council and the public to have accurate information. Right now, as the city is on the brink of ending punitive segregation, we need a well-resourced Board of Correction. The board's issued a proposed rule that will end the longstanding practice of isolating individuals in solitary confinement. However, the alternative units that the rule will create are potentially as restrictive as the ones the rule seeks to replace. During the public comment period, we will advocate for changes to improve the rule so that solitary confinement is actually ended and not just given a new name. But the successful implementation of these rules will require the board to have the means to regularly observe the operation of the alternative units and analyze and report data to determine whether the new regulations bring about the meaningful change intended. I urge the council to fund the Board of Corrections at the level needed to effectively carry out this vital work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. I would like to now welcome Darren Mack to testify, followed by Brandon Holmes and then Jordan Rosenthal. Time starts now. I don't see Darren Mack, so if we can move on. Oh. There he he's is. here. He's here. I saw him. He's, he's in my top left, but I don't know where he's on. Here. There he is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so. Good afternoon, Chair, Member Powers, and Committee members. Um. Thank you so much 
for this hearing on um, public te testimonies today. I'm testifying on behalf of Freedom Agenda and as a survivor of the last penal colony in the United States, Rikers Island. For years, we have been pushing and pulling for system transformation away from systems of punishment like DOC and towards systems of healing. DOC has the highest jailing, jail staffing ratio in the United States, more than eight times higher than the national average. As of January 2021, DOC had 8,950 uniformed staff and approximately 5,200 people in their custody. Based on recommended jail staffing ratios, DC, DOC currently employs over 5,000 excess officers at a cost of over $1 billion annually. This high ratio of staff to people in custody has not made the jails safer. In fact, it seems to make them less safe. According to findings by the Federal Nunes Monitor in their ninth report, jail staff's hyper-confrontational practices are driving violence on Rikers Island. DOC cannot manage their staff well with a ratio of staff to people in custody that is higher than anywhere else in the world, there were recently reports of staff working triple shifts. This is unsafe for everyone involved and it is explicable with so many excess staff. DOC staff and their union should be calling for the city to lay out a just transition, a transition into the economic future outside of this failed system of punishment that is scheduled to close into city jobs with the same pay and benefits. The city must waste no more time in initiating a just transition by eliminating jobs that are both unnecessary and harmful. I'm calling, lastly, I'm calling that we deflate DOC's bloated budget and develop a plan for a just transition for staff. Thank you so much. And I'll sit, submit my testimony. Good. Thank you. We'll take a look at it when it's submitted to. Thanks. I'd like to now welcome Brandon Holmes to testify, followed by Jordan Rosenthal and then Kondra Clark. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Powers and committee members. Uh, during April 2020, in the early months of the pandemic, the average daily jail population was just over 3,800 individuals in custody. And as of January 2021, the Department of Corrections employed 8,950 uniform staff to supervise roughly 5,200 people in custody. At over eight times the national average of staff to people in custody, New York City has the single largest jail staffing ratio in the entire United States. Yet despite their operational advantages and a significantly reduced population, this agency continues to uphold the legacy of torture and brutality, which drove our electorate to shutter the facilities they've operated and oversee for generations. This year, we must all be reflecting on a massive failure to reduce law enforcement budgets in response to the historic movement for black lives and peaceful protests that mobilized tens of thousands of New Yorkers. In the consent decree, which was reached in 2015, there was a federal monitor appointed to oversee the Department of Corrections as a result of lawsuits against the department for subjecting people on Rikers to excessive and unnecessary force. Some of the key findings, which I'll submit in my written testimony, use of force rates have increased over 10 reporting periods by 259% since 2015 and the department remains out of compliance with several key areas of the consent decree. Most recently, the monitor stated that the city and department have established a record of non-compliance in the most fundamental goals of the consent judgment from 2015, most especially regarding the use of force and accountability for violations of those requirements. So it cannot be stressed enough for what many folks have said before that DOC is just not managed well that this high ratio of staff to people in custody has not made anybody safer. And more staff, we're asking uh, to, to increase the numbers due to people working overtime, working doubles, triple shifts, is not going to make anybody safer as we maintain one of the largest, if not the largest, staffing complement for jails in the United States. So, you know, I, I just ask that today, 
we remember the attitude and comments of former COVA president Elias Hasmadine, who shared in the past in years of testimony before city council that the culture of COBA and DOC has always been that they hold the belief that they're the police of the city's jails. It's no secret that they demand that the city protect and provide for them in the same way that police officers demand to be protected and provided for. So I call on city council this budget cycle to treat DOC like other law enforcement, put them under a microscope and draw the connections between the disparities of health and equity in our communities and our government agents in law enforcement. They've both been found guilty of heavily documented histories of the same atrocities, harassment, murder, abuse, violence. So uh, I ask that we seize this opportunity to divest from law enforcement agencies and systems of punishment and invest in alternative practices um, and invest in council action that is going to hold the city agencies accountable. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you for the testimony. Nice to see you. I hope you're safe and healthy. I would like to now welcome jo Jordan Rosenthal to testify, followed by Condra Clark and then Pilar de Jesus. Time starts now. Hi, and thank you, Chair Powers and City Council members um, for being here today, specifically um, Council Member Rosenthal for joining us. And it's really nice to see Bobby Cohen and Emily Turner stay on to hear public testimony. Um, so I'm really here to talk and implore the city council to find out more about that 107 million that's being dedicated specifically to the Rose Dem Singer Center and State of Repairs. Um, before, you know, um, Council Member Rosenthal was imploring kind of why the women were spread out all over the facility. And we were given kind of a lame duck answer from the DOC. And if the city really has a commitment to closing the Rosem Singer Center, um, on your timeline, which is 2026, 2027, but we really implore you to push it sooner to 2022, there isn't a need to make all of these like million dollar renovations when we should really be actively putting women where they are the most safe, which is home in their communities, which means we need to expand alternatives to incarceration and alternatives to detention, but specifically outlining budget items that say that it goes towards women and gender expansive people. We have a lot of alternative to incarceration programs in the city that serve women, but it's not an adequate representation. And women are once again, and getting kind of the short end of the stick. We need to also employ the city and to really make access um, for women with serious violent felonies to be diverted to these programs because that's a majority of the women in the population that we're currently talking about. Um, you know, basically being in Rosie's is a threat to oneself. Everything in your life starts to unravel in the sense of your stability. And it doesn't make sense to make, you know, to basically invest all of this money into a facility that's going to time be expired. Um, thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. I would like to now welcome Kendra Clark to testify, followed, followed by Pilar de Jesus and then Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips. Time starts now. Hello, everyone, and thank you for um, having this hearing today. Um, and Councilmember Powers, I'm definitely going to shoot you an email after because I was actually illegally discharged from Rikers back in 2010. So just, you know, listening to the, the testimony earlier today. Um, you know, this has been happening for, for quite a while. Um, I think what I'm most frustrated about, right, I've, I've been on this campaign since 2016. This has been an advocate's movement to close Rikers Island. And there's 10 Nunes reports that show that the violence is increasing 200 plus percent. You know, there's a two to one staff to client ratio. And the mismanagement of, of the facility uh, financially, I, I just don't, I can't understand it. I can't understand why nonprofits uh, budgets are cut in half and we're still required to do the same amount of work. We're not able to pay, get paid for double and triple shifts. And we work seven days a week, right? And we don't have a two to one to staff to client ratio. I also don't understand why our alternative to incarceration programs have been proven to have a 20% or less recidivism rate 
Yet you continue to incarcerate people with violent charges on Rikers Island instead of putting them in alternative to incarceration programs that are ran by reentry organizations who work with the same population as the Department of Corrections and do not use use of force, do not use solitary confinement, and use actual uh, de-escalation methods in trauma-informed care. So I think just when we're looking at the numbers, I, I cried so hard when I heard that anyone was gonna come on this line and say that they needed more officers. That is insanity. And I just really wanna press it to the council members. Like this is now on you. For the last 10 years that these new NEDS reports have been coming out, the violence has continued to increase. Officers are not mental health providers. They are not educators. They are not there to provide therapeutic intervention. If you need more staff on Rikers Island, you need more of I, us. I, you need more formerly incarcerated people who have these uh, you know, skill sets and can come in and do it. The last thing you need is correctional officers. All you are gonna do is continue to incite this, this increase in violence. The correctional officers cannot uh, manage this and the fact that we would pay triple overtime and it's a two to one staff ratio like I'm just trying for nonprofits to get on board with that like how can we get a two to one staff to client ratio and then get paid triple time um, I, I would love to do to see some statistics I actually want numbers there's 1200 people out sick a day I was told you guys have unlimited sick time what are these people out sick for we've been open in person during COVID the entire time and we have not had staff that have about for six months, even the ones who have caught COVID. So, you know, I want answers from you all. What, what is this money going to? Why is there a two to one staff to client ratio and we still have officers that are about sick? Out of those 1200 officers, how many days have they called out sick in 2020? Do they have medical documentation? Because again, coming from a nonprofit worker who has been working in person this entire time, the, the disparity is just not fair. So I'm really hoping that we can get some answers from you all. Thanks, Kedra. I would like to now welcome Pilar de Jesus to testify, followed by Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips, then David Frudenthal. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, and forgive me, um, voice is a little, a little harsh. Um, my name is Pilar, and thank you, um, Council, for having this, and thank you, um, you know, everyone who is here, but especially some people I see, some allies. Um, I'm Pilar de Jesus. I am a woman born and raised in East Harlem. I'm an aunt. I'm a fighter. I'm an advocate. I'm a leader in New York City. I'm a survivor of the racist, outdated racist policies that exist in this country and in this city. And a survivor of Rikers Island and of, you know, the very abusive um the forces of this city, um, in my experience. Um, but I'm here to talk on behalf because I'm also an advocacy coordinator with Take Root Justice. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of our committee um, that is called HAPPEN, which is Holistic Abolition of Prisons and Police Everywhere Now, which um, HAPPENS pretty much supports the, the, the work of movements and community-led co campaigns to, to increase police accountability um, we want to combat, you know, all this very abusive policies around, um, you know, our communities and our people of color. I mean, increasing our commitment and capacity around policing issues and community safety. Um, and so we work with many folks who are here around different campaigns, including the Closing Rikers campaign, um, Abolishing ICE, um, you know, we work with the COVID-19 Police Project, Defund NYPD, National Expungement Week, um, we're also part of the Smart Coalition and so many other things. But, you know, I, like um, Ms. Clark just mentioned, you know, I work at a nonprofit and it is really hard to hear, you know, we need more money, we need more money. And, and I'm hearing we're getting cuts. We're here like figuring out how we're going to manage and support all the clients. I work in the tenant unit and we all know that housing right now is really, um, you know, a, a issue in this city. And so our our attorneys, on top of all the other attorneys, like all the all the work we're doing is the 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 need is increased. And on top of that, we have to deal with our own mental health. So it's really, you know, disheartening to hear about all oh, over time and all of this. And it is a lot of mismanagement of money. And I, it it should not even this shouldn't even be a discussion. But here we are. And um, 
you know, another thing like I wanted to talk to when they, some, you know, that when they were talking about the recordings, and this is not really what I came to speak up, but we're listening um, about the recordings of the prison and the prisons that were happening. You know, why do we even work with systems that that was even an option on a drop down? Why, why are we, why are we okaying um, the record, the invasion of humans privacy just because they're in prison, whether we put the drop down or not? I think that that's a, that's a problem and that um, says, you know, again, goes to the very outdated racist policies that still exist in this country, regardless if we try to reform them. So asking for more money, in my opinion, is not good. Um, but I also want to talk to the intro of 2210, where, you know, it talks about the creation of an Office of Community Mental Health within the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I think that's a different hearing and also we just have to cut you off. There. Okay, but at the end of the day, they, you know, that shouldn't be more money going towards agencies for, again, for the police. At the end of the day, it's for more enforcement. But if, if we want to stick to, like, more money for cor um, correction officers versus nonprofits, again, you know, Mr. Powers, we use your office a lot for, you know, the housing hotline. And, you know, those numbers increase. And so when we hear we have immigration rights, we have workers' rights, and we all know a lot of folks have been their work, um, their rights as workers have been violated. So we are at capacity and yet we can't hire because we can't, um, you know, um, affords to, and we have been going forward with court hearings. We have been having meetings. We are still meeting. And again, um, you know, to the violin where the-, the Okay, wait, I'm sorry, we, you were, you were our time is up. So I need to keep going just because we're on a, a, our, our clock is getting shorter here to for the hearing, but thank you. And thank you for the work you're doing. Um, we'll go to the next one, thanks. I would like to now welcome Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips to testify, followed by David Rudenthal, and then Kelly Grace Price. Time starts now. Can you unmute? Okay, thanks. Hello, I can. Can you hear me? Peace and blessings, everyone. So usually, this always happens. I type up something to say, and then I listen to everything that's discussed. And so, no, it doesn't happen like that. So peace and blessings. I'm Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips, a member of the Jails Action Coalition, Justice for Women Task Force, and many other coalitions to make a change in this city. Um, a couple of things I just want to touch on that are really important is that I, I don't say this often, depending on what context I'm speaking in. Many times I'll speak from an advocate standpoint, but I also work at the Mental Health Project Urban Justice Center, the ones who do the monitoring for Brad H. And I'm saying this for a reason today because I'm documented and registered in New York City as a clergy member, and I work at the Mental Health Project Urban Justice Center. Anytime I speak to an incarcerated individual, it's on my office phone given to me by the Urban Justice Center, known to DOC. I too have been recorded. They have no excuse to not know our number is from a legal servicing agency. So please hold them accountable for that. Um, another thing is around the COVID issue, people are still not getting PPE. I've testified on this on, on, at BOC hearings. People are only allowed the mask when they're leaving their unit. Um, I brought this paperwork up at the last BOC hearing. I was given these by uniform staff. These are actual count sheets from housing units showing that um, after um, Commissioner Brand told the Board of Corrections that she could not guarantee 50% social distancing in housing units. Um, officers printed out housing unit count sheets for me. And so I was able to see even two weeks after having a conversation with DOC, housing units at 48 with 50 beds. Two weeks after that, I was asked, I asked for another report, housing units at 50 beds. So DOC is not even trying to social distance, even after having it being consistently raised to them by the Board of Corrections. Also, I would like to mention Benny from the Officers Union testified that 14 of his, 1,400 of his officers contracted COVID last year. I would like to know how many people in population were tested because of coming into contact with those- Time expired. I actually have testified on the record that a, a captain in AMKC died and many people called me begging for COVID tests in those housing units that did, wasn't given access to it. Many people are calling for medical reasons that BOC can't even follow up with. Please give them back their funding. People can die without having proper access to um, 
to medical services or even escorts. That's a lot of things. DOC will send 20 officers to do a search and not have enough officers to take someone to a medical appointment. Please hold them. I know you're going to cut me off, but please hold oh, them. Uh, so, go ahead. Keep going. I just, I just want you to know that even today, this is a... This, over 10 years, I've been testifying to you. A couple of years ago, I asked you to increase DOC's budget because they needed officers, because they was working three shifts. I don't know if you remember that. I asked you to increase BOC's budget because they didn't even have the 20 plus staff to actually do the work. Now you're pulling them away. Please do your job. New Yorkers depend on council to stand up for all constituents. And remember, Rikers is not a prison. Rikers is a jail where your constituents are waiting supposedly for their fair day in court. Make sure that they're entitled to that. Please have a blessed day. Thank you. You too. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. And any recordings you want, feel free to ask me. I'll send them to your office. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks as always. I would like to now welcome David Freudenthal to testify, followed by Kelly G Grace Price, then Michael Pope. Time starts now. Chair Powers, uh, I'm David Freudenthal. Uh, Government Relations Director at Carnegie Hall. Thanks to you. Thanks to Council Members Rosenthal, Holden, uh, and Riley for, for your attention and, and Council Member uh, Ro Holden for your expressed support. I'm here to, to reinforce uh, uh, Department of Probation uh, Commissioner's uh, uh, Anna Bermudez uh, testimony um, about the Neon Arts Program, speaking from the perspective of the, uh, of the arts partner. Um, we, wanted, we wanna thank the City Council uh, for the partnership of uh, and support for the Neon Arts Program, um, which in the past, uh, in, in FY21, which uh, fostered, uh, again, as uh, Commissioner Bermudez uh, stated, uh, enabled us to really uh, to do a, an incredibly effective uh, pivot to digital services over the past year, which significantly expanded the reach and breadth of the program. Uh, serving more than 800 uh, individuals with live remote digital arts uh, uh, workshops via Zoom, uh, which was a, an amazing demonstration of the need and interest of young New Yorkers around the program, uh, around the city. Um, our target audience expanded beyond the seven neon arts, the neon neighborhoods, to include uh, outreach to those in 28 neighborhoods, uh, the 28 neighborhoods that are most impacted by COVID. Uh, in addition to having many other health and socioeconomic, socioeconomic disparities. Um, we, we need your support in the year ahead so that we can continue this work and really move to a combination of a live and a and digital pivot um, uh, to, to, to really to capture, you know, that great breadth uh, in extended services. Um, you know, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a big success this year. Um, you have my testimony for the record. I'm grateful for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thanks as always, and and thanks to everything you're doing. And I know that institution has been through a lot over the last uh, year being closed. And I know some relief is on its way. But thanks for all you guys are doing and thinking about all the cultural institutions here and and your work alongside many folks here. So thanks, thanks, David. I would like to now welcome Kelly Grace Price to testify, followed by Michael Pope, then Jane Elk. Time starts now. Hi, sorry, it's Kelly Grace Price from Close Rosies. Thank you for allowing me to testify this afternoon. I wanted to um, first start off reemphasizing that Board of Correction funding is crucial. It sounds like there's some seeds of hope there. Please water them. Um, I also would like to address uh, something I always address in these budget hearings every year. We'd really like gender transparency in the DOC budget. We're not seeing funding for women and girls at all on parity with the percentage of the population that we represent. And we'd like some transparency. I say this every year and promises are made and we never get it. <clears throat> the, the next couple of things I'd like to talk about, uh, of course, the phone calls. Uh, Chair Powers, I don't know if you know, but the Department of Corrections uh, recording program is also run in conjunction with the DA's offices. 
It's called a uh, DA Info, I N P H O. And it's much written about in reports published by, say, Court Innovation. Uh, I'm going to read you uh, something from a Court Innovation report published in 2017 about the call recording program. Specifically, it is called an internship program. Quote, part of the New York City Department of Corrections policy is to record all phone calls made by defendants. These calls are a vital resource for local district attorneys who use the intelligence to successfully prosecute criminal defendants. However, a single offender can amass a large volume of phone calls, which can overwork ADAs. As a result, the Crime Strategy Unit created an internship program through a pre-established relationship with the National Guard, where area ROTC students listen to phone calls and document potentially useful information as it relates to projects, priority offenders, or requests from an ADA. In the early phase of CSU, these interns had top secret security clearances, were monitored by a National Guard member, and worked off site. Since the fall of 2001, CSU restricted the, the internship program to resemble a college oh, course. <clears throat> I'll submit this, of course, in my testimony, but I wanted to let you know that uh, these programs are well documented. They're run in conjunction with the DA's offices. The DA's offices actually have a database of these calls. Um, and there's absolutely no way that the DA's offices didn't know that this was going on. Uh, please pay attention uh, to my testimony. I'll provide the links and the, the, the relevant quotes. The last thing I want to say, Chair Powers, is please, I've been asking you since before you were city councilman, we need transparency with data reporting regarding sexual violence on Rikers. Your bill did not reap full transparency. Please, before the end of this term, let's reach an agreement that we'll find a way to get that. Thank you so much for letting me testify today, and I'll turn in my written comments. Great, thank you, thanks so much. I would like to now welcome Michael Pope to testify, followed by Jane Elk, then David Long. Time starts now. Hi everybody, thank you Chair Powers, committee members and staff for the opportunity to provide this testimony and for the powerful comments already made so far. Uh, by way of quick introduction, my name is Mike Pope. Uh, and I'm the executive director here at Youth Represent, a New York City legal service nonprofit providing criminal and civil reentry legal representation to young people 24 and under. Uh, we assist them with everything from rap sheets to review, uh, review to fighting employment discrimination on the basis of race and criminal justice, school suspensions, and many other legal needs. Um, we feared that many young people that we serve would be some of the hardest hit by the COVID crisis. And frankly, that's exactly what we're seeing. Youth fighting economic hardship, uh, stress of lockdown, difficulty of remote learning, severely disproportionate rates of infections and loss of life, and pressure conti to continue working in unsafe conditions. Uh, this is all made worse by high unemployment that is tight in the labor market, which is increasing the likelihood of discrimination against system-involved youth. Uh, with your support, however, I'm proud of the way that Youth Represent has showed up. Um, we launched a legal hotline for community to quickly connect with legal reentry support. Um, I shared the information in my written testimony. Please share it with your constituents. We want to make sure that folks are getting that information. Um, and also specifically with the critical support from council through the Innovative Criminal Justice Programs Initiative. Uh, we've supported 181 young people and provided 51 virtual know your rights workshops. This could not have been done without an incredible staff I work with, a group of young people who we serve that are funny and, and, and strong and passionate and ready to change the system and well, uh, as well as, of course, support from council. Um, I came today with two hopes. One, that you consider renewing our essential funding and two, that you seriously consider our increased funding request. I deeply understand the financial struggles we all face from government to nonprofit, but we ask for an additional 10,000 that will go directly into our emergency client fund. That money is just redistributed at 100% back into the community for emergency client needs. Some problems can be solved by policy, some by litigation, and some by getting cash in the hands of our clients. And so that's what we want to do with that money. I'm expired. And on that, I am done, and I appreciate everyone's time. Very good timing. Thanks. Nice to see you, and we'll certainly look for your funding request. Thanks so much. I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by, I forgot to acknowledge from Councilman Riley as well, who I know had a earlier hearing and has joined us since. So welcome to him as well. Thanks. I would like to now welcome Jane Elk to testify, followed by David Long and then Curtis Bell. Okay. Time starts now. <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Jane Elke. My husband and I own and reside in a co-op apartment just a few blocks from the Brooklyn House of Detention. 
I became interested and involved in the Close Rikers campaign in 2016 through the First Presbyterian Church of Brooklyn. I have friends who are directly impacted as well as some who work within the system. And I'm currently an active supporter of the freedom agenda of the Urban Justice Center who you've been hearing from today. I'm here to ask you to please listen to and seriously consider the recommendations of organizations like the Freedom Agenda. Use your budgetary powers to affect real change. Our city's criminal justice system needs to be reformed. The overall cost keeps escalating with no real improvement. The BOC needs much more funding as been shown today. And um, the overall costs keep escalating. It's obvious to anybody with even a rudimentary awareness of what goes on. I've even heard reports of mail services at Rikers not always being dependable. With an excess of staff, why are such basic operations deficient? Our DOC has the highest jail staffing, jail staffing ratio in the United States, yet our jails are notoriously unsafe places. I've been told that regular acts of violence involving staff occur and lack of enforcement of such basic health and safety regulations occur regularly, even such as wearing masks during the pandemic. And that that's, that rule is posted all over the, in Rikers Island, but it not, it's, it's not enforced from what I hear. Uh, about the phone issue that you're talking tonight, I don't understand now thinking like, well, when I make a personal call to a loved one, in jail, who is there pre-trial, can't afford bail, why should our phone conversations be I'm recorded? Sorry. Okay, it's also common sense mental health care is best provided in care-focused jail a setting, not a jail. Let me just sum up, we're all victims of a poorly designed and managed system, but the cost per person incarcerated continues to rise and it boggles my mind. In a nutshell, I wanna live in a kinder, safer community and not feel that any of my family or my neighbors are subject to cruel, unfair, disrespectful treatment by the very institutions that are supposed to bring us all comfort and peace. Please use your power thoughtfully and with sound moral values. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for the testimony. I would like to now welcome David Long to testify followed by Curtis Bell, then Rosalind Barber. Time starts now. Chair Powers and committee members and staff, thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Dave Long and I am the Executive Director of the Liberty Fund. This testimony will outline the continued need for the Liberty Fund in the current landscape and how our innovative, adaptive model paves the way for continued justice reform in New York City. I previously attached a two-page flyer which provides the specifics on our two programs, which are the uh, charitable bail program, which has been seen an uptick in cases since the July bail rollbacks, and our ROR case management program. For four years, FY's 2017 to 2020, the New York City Council had been one of our major partners. However, our New York City Council funding was 100% eliminated for FY21, for FY jeopardizing justice reform previously made prior to the confluences of COVID and social unrest of last year. We hope that New York City Council will renew our FY 2022, will renew us in FY 2022 to provide our essential services for New York's most vulnerable and help us lead the nation in continued justice reform. Through, through our charitable bail program and ROR case management services, we provide service plans, wellness calls, court reminders, and emergency needs to connect clients to best fit workforce development, homelessness referrals, in order to stabilize their lives and to prevent further recidivism. Our groundbreaking approach ensures no net widening and builds personal agency for individuals from New York City communities that have been historically impacted by racial and, and social injustices. We have been listening for the last two or three hours about the problems that are occurring at Rikers Island. One of the solutions can also be an investment in community-based programs such as the Liberty Fund, which provides for services on a voluntary basis, which will then allow people to stay in the community and not, not get rearrested and not go back to Rikers Island. Thank you. Thank you, nice to see you. Thanks for the testimony and appreciate all the work nice, you're doing. Nice to see you, Mr. Powers. Yeah, thanks. 
I would like to now welcome Curtis Bell to testify, followed by Rosalind Barber and then Eileen Marr. Time yeah. starts now. Good afternoon. Um, I hope all families are well throughout this pandemic. And for those who have lost anyone, you have my deepest condolences. Those who, <clears throat> those who can make you believe the absurdity can also make you commit the greatest atrocities, said Voltaire. COBA in conjunction with Docs Today here have put on the greatest political spin we have ever witnessed. Council member Holden, COBA furnished employee shift data and statistical analysis to paint a picture of an overworked and overstaffed correctional institution. However, the average daily jail population in New York City fell by 52%. New York City, the officer to detainee ratio is off. And this needs to be recognized. They are using data manipulatively to create the hero syndrome. The hero syndrome is a term describing a person who creates a harmful situation to an object or person to come in at the end to provide a solution as the hero. Officers get paid for their shifts. Officers bid for shifts. Officers even swap shifts. I know this for a fact. I've lived in a correctional institution for 18 years. This is a part of the cultural norm. So when a person takes data and statistics to show a correlation, the causation is choice. There's no forced labor in New York. There's choices. And as far as recording of 50, 1,500 phone calls. There are men and women in, in prison for committing one human error. Fifth, uh, 1,500 consecutive? That's not error. That is a consorted effort to work in conjunction with the NYPD, to work in conjunction with assistant DAs and the DA's office to convict people. Every lawyer on this call knows of fruits of a poisonous tree. You have to correlate those phone calls to those court transcripts, and then you will see a strategy started to develop to incarcerate men. That is desecrating the sanctuary of law. That should not be in Doc's hands. Resignation should be handed down. But we continue as a city to incentivize good behavior. And that's what the Nunez monitors highlight. 10 years of monitoring, and we continue to incentivize good behavior. What message is that sending to our children? No, this is a money grab. And in a climate of defund the NYPD, in a climate of defund docs, of course, they're going to create this political spin. Do not be naive about emotional appeals that are deceptive. And that's what we heard today. We heard people abandoning their ethical duty and desecrate the sanctuary of law, but we let them get around a bigger issue. They are committing legal genocide to black and brown bodies. That is the end result is a conviction. And if you want us to obey and uphold and believe in the law, the public officials need to maintain their ethical responsibility or lead. These aren't digits. This is not just data. We are lives. And what I'm hearing today is people try to justify and Council Member Rosenthal leading them with phrases. Oh, you mean you need more money? Oh, you need more? Like, and the lady wasn't going to say it. And, and, and it's sad because as a man that engaged in the process of self-transformation after prison, we have been giving the first critical evidence that the system is inherently rigged. It's inherently rigged. Curtis, if I know. We don't have, you. We we... Do not have this confidentiality between client and attorney, which is the bedrock of law. Who are they manipulating? Thank you. Right, thank you. Thanks. Next, we'll hear from Rosalind Barber, followed by Eileen Marr. Time starts now. 
Good evening. I'm Rosalind Barber. I'm the Administrative Chief of Staff at the Public Theater. Thank you to Councilmember Powers and the committee members for holding today's hearing. I want to honor and thank all of the nonprofit leaders and advocates for incarcerated people that have testified today during this important hearing. Over the past year, the work of the public has been transformed by the COVID-19 pandemic and has pivoted to making its work available digitally to the people of the city of New York free of charge through new initiatives that do not require physical gathering. Prior to the pandemic, we had partnered with both the federal prison system and the New York City Department of Correction to develop arts-based initiatives with their populations. They recognize the potential impact theater has in shaping the trajectory, healing, and overall quality of life in their facilities. In light of the pandemic, we adapted our planned in-person curriculum into a distance learning format. Working closely with our incredible teaching artist, Malik Work, and newly formed Corrections Advisory Group and the brilliant staff of the Public Theater, our first digital workshop series, Hip Hop versus Shakespeare, was developed and encouraged participants to write and present their own stories in verse and prose. Within the first month of releasing the first video, over 700 people expressed interest in the program through the tablet system. We are proud to have found ways to make our programming available to all New Yorkers, especially incarcerated people during this terrible time of isolation and hopelessness for everyone in New York City. Our hope is that this work will continue to heal individuals and communities throughout the, this pandemic and beyond. The public is also a proud member of the Cultural Institutions Group. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, CIGs have remained committed to supporting New Yorkers and serving the civic allies in the city of New York. Collectively, we've spent about $2 million in order to ensure New Yorkers, including incarcerated people, were able to continue to access quality virtual programming. We ask that as you are considering this year's city budget, Time expired. the budget will be held harmless and maintained at FY21 levels so that we can con continue to do this important work alongside all of you. Thank you. Thank you. We're very excited, of course, about the announcement last week about the Shakespeare coming back. I think I went to Shakespeare in the Park. I think I went when the 12th night when they had members of the Fortune Society there a few years ago. And then I actually was at the Fortune Society the next day and met one of them, coincidentally enough. So thank you for the work you're doing. And I know it's uh, not an easy time for cultural and arts right now, but, um, but some hope is hopefully, hopefully some hope is on the way here. Thank you so much. Yes, we're very proud to work with Fortune Society as well. And look forward to get, getting back to that work. Got it. We look forward to having you back. Thanks so much. I would like to now welcome Eileen Marr to testify. Time starts now. Good evening, everybody. My name is Eileen Marr. I'm a, a member of the Justice for Women Task Force, as well as a CRU leader at Vocal New York. I am also a formerly incarcerated survivor of domestic violence. Approximately 420 days of my initial incarceration were spent at Rosie's on Rikers Island. It is my understanding that over $107 million is included in this budget proposal that would be used to make physical improvements on Rosie's. However, the plan that, uh, that the city council voted on previously is to close Rikers. So I have to ask why. Detainee and city sentence population is down. That is um, this, Why would DOC want to use, sorry about that. Why would DOC want to use any money to fix Rosie's when the plan is to not be there much longer? To myself and everyone else who has been fighting tooth and nail to close Rosie's and Rikers Island, this seems as, uh, this seems, um, uh, this seems to be a means to delay or even stop said closing. Maybe you think that if you slap some paint on Rosie's and make, make it look real pretty, that the course of fate will not, will change, that the, uh, that Rosie's and the remaining island will not close. But I see through your budget, your budgetary manipulations as do some of my fellow activists. Rather than worrying about fixing Rosie's or anywhere else on that island up, the budget must focus on moving the women of Rikers in a safe, healthy, and expeditious manner, either to alternative to incarcerations, home, or other facilities off of the island. This, is, this seems to be a stall tactic, and it's sad. As I, spent, I, as I said, I spent oh, well over a year on Rosie's, and I, know, and I knew then, as I know now, that Rosie's and Rikers is a cancer. It is a- uh, Time expired. Count your, uh, 
the, DO, uh, the DOC and the BOC should count your losses, acknowledge the catastrophic mistake that was made when the island was stolen from the indigenous people and turned into a jail all those years ago and stop procrastinating. Expedite closing Rosies and Rikers and cancel the paint job. Turn the New York City Department of Corrections into a leader in, in curbing mass incarceration, not a key catalyst in the cancer of mass incarceration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Just want to check with the council. Do we have any other panelists here today? Nope, this concludes public testimony, but if we have inadvertently forgotten to call on someone, if you could please use the Zoom raise hand function now, we will try to hear from you. I will turn it over to the Chair Powers to close the hearing. Okay, thank you everybody for your testimony and for all those particularly who waited so long to get to the uh, opportunity to testify, but recognize we'll read through all submitted testimony and of course we'll uh, be taking notes on all the other uh, issues raised here today. And, and you know, unfortunately heard some very concerning issues again today that we're gonna have to address. So I wanna thank everyone for sticking with us through that and your work and efforts to help highlight the uh, issues here within our criminal justice system in New York City. We'll be having another hearing, I believe in May for the executive budget and we'll have another opportunity to hear from the agency. So thank you everyone today. Thank you to the staff, everybody uh, who helped with this hearing together. We're deeply appreciative of you. And until uh, we all can, can see each other in person, please stay safe and stay healthy. And with that, I will gavel out. Thanks so much.